these things down. Hey everybody, it is Corey Poirier back again as promised. And of course we're back live with the Blue Talks Flip Your Script virtual event. Uh, this is actually our third Blue Talks Flip Your Script virtual event. Uh, so these things keep on coming, uh, no slowing us down. It's been um, such a great experience so far. I'm so glad that, and I don't think this has been shared often enough. I'm so glad that at least talked me into this because just a little back. I inspired you into it. By the way, I'm Elise Rothman, the co-host, just in case, you know, it's your first time here. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even introduce myself really fully. Um, but um, uh, we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll circle back to that. And I'll just say that because, uh, again, I don't share it often. So I don't I want to make sure I share it today. But how this event came about, because I think uh, if people are like me. They like, um, you know, knowing behind the scenes a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so behind the scenes is that. Uh, I least came to me and said, I, I don't know if you've seen the Rise Up Virtual Challenge that Pete Vargas is putting on, where he has a whole bunch of really relatively big name speakers, like Tony Robbins was on it, and um, Prince Marie Forleo. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, some people that I really, I mean, amazing, amazing speakers. And it was a 23-day event, and it actually ended with a huge event. It was kind of yeah. right when you were launching, you were going to start to launch the whole Blue Talks thing. Absolutely. And you had said, I'd love to do something like that. Um, but I don't necessarily know right now if I have the community to do it, like meaning the sort of ecosystem behind it, uh, just to start from scratch. And you said, but then I thought, wait a minute, I'm a part of Blue Talks. And that's sort of an ecosystem like that. And so the, he said to me, what do you think of the idea of us doing something like that? And I, I'll, I won't bore people with the details of all the in-betweens, but basically, uh, at least brought it to me and said, what do you think? And I mean, from my end, I was, and admittedly, I was hesitant at first because I'm like, okay, we're doing the live events. We're doing, we had a lot on the go, but also I'm like, I have, you know, and I still, by the way, we just did a live event three weeks ago. So it's not like the live events don't exist, but right. I was a little bit hesitant because I'm like, well, live events have slowed down, but you know, I'm optimistic they're going to speed back up again soon. And I just didn't know if it made sense to put the efforts there. And then the more I thought about it and the more I at least talked to me. Uh, and like you said, it wasn't that you sold me on it, but it was just like, said, you know, I'm this like, is what's possible. I got this, Corey. Just l get the speakers. I'll help you behind the scenes. We'll put it together. We'll do it together and see how it goes. And mm -hmm. now we're seeing how it's how it grows, really. Absolutely. And, and the first one... Uh, was a major success. I was super excited by the uh, the uptake, the amount of people that watched it, the amount of speakers that jumped on board. And so I just want to tell people that's how this all started. Uh, so, and the combination of the name Blue Talks uh, presents Flip Your Script or just Blue Talks Flip Your Script experience, whichever way you want to say that, is kind of a combination or merging of sort of the two of us because I lease has been doing the flip your script thing for a while. Obviously, I've been doing the blue thing, blue talks thing, building it and getting ready to launch. And so it became, which is the way actually at least you presented it to me is what if this blue talks was the stage and flip your script was the event. So almost like, and so that kind of opened the door for me to do the blue talks amplify your message event, which is a totally different event, not even slightly competitive with this one because Compliment, I see it as a compliment. <laughs> It so is because when we're on that one, we talk about it, talk about this one, and we're on this one, we talk every now and then about that one. But right. the difference is that event is basically we bring on people to talk about how you can write, uh, speak, and podcast your message. So it's a right. totally different game altogether, whereas this one I find is more around mindset, how you can get the right mindset to take on the world and flip your script, your story. Um, so right, I just well, and, and when you learn to intentionally – like script the way that you think and then the way that you speak and the way that you share, then you, the message that you're amplifying has more impact. So they really do tie in together. It starts here before it can get here. 100%. And it's also, I mean, the interesting part about it is that um, this one here, it, it, I find that it's even the, the nature of the talks are completely different. So there's not, you can't even, you wouldn't even recognize one to the other. Like if you watch the Amplify Your Message event, it feels like a totally different event, which is even partly like I've had at least come on, I think it goes one or two times on there. And the interesting part is you're such a great co-host. I would love to have you on every event I do. But I also Thanks. think this be, this sort of, when people see this, you on it, they know this is the Flip Your Script event. Right. And I all feel like that gives it two separate signatures as well. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to give people a backstory as to how this all came to life, because I think that's important for people to know. And then the secondary part is uh, I, I'll also uh, 
and that Elisa, as she mentioned, uh, has been doing this now for the last uh, few go rounds. We talked yesterday about the work that Elise does, and maybe we'll take some time to do that today as well. I will say, right after our first speaker, we have a like a we have a, like a buffer today of about 10, 15 minutes. Okay, uh, great. So that's why I'm not like super concerned because I know she's still going to get her full time. Um, but we'll get a chance to because I want to talk about you buying a hotel in the midst of COVID, uh, and then maybe we'll talk about the work you do then as well to further introduce you. Uh, but to go backwards a step, Corey Poirier, this is we talked. Script event. Uh, this is Elise Rothman with me. And for all things Blue Talks, if you want to know more about Blue Talks, uh, what it looks like, what we do, um, if you want to watch the, uh, the videos, like the live talks, uh, Elise Jersey is coming out in the next week or two, I think. So we're super close now. Uh, your video, but your podcast has already aired, I believe, um, meaning like the audio. So people can check that out already. And then there's the book series. People want to check out all that stuff. They can go to bluetalks.com and you'll find the links for each of those. Uh, at least you're going to be in a future uh, book as well. We got to get that in the works. I um, know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> we're going to make that work too. So you'll be able to find at least the story even more so in a, in a future book. I'll also tell you one other thing. Week of January uh, 18th. This, this is like people are like, what? We're not even at Christmas yet. But the week of January 18th is when we're going to be doing the next Blue Talks event. And I jumped the game and, and, and the shark this time around. Almost all the speakers are booked now. All and right. So Yay. We're, we're I love it. Stuff early on this time. So I just, that's kind of the housekeeping. Having said all that, let's jump right in because if you come on uh, here, you know, we're already seven minutes in and you still haven't seen your first speaker and you know, I like to not mince uh, meat. Let's just make it all happen. So having said that, going to bring on our first speaker. I'm actually going to bring her onto the screen so we can say hi to her. Hey, and hey. so Sue, I, I, I should have asked you this previously, but pronunciation of your last name, is it Takaro? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I, I got lucky. I'm not going to say I, I I was astute, but I got hi, lucky. Hi, Sue. Hey, Elise. Great Good to, see, to you. see you again. So excited to be able to be here. Me too. It's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome to have you, Sue. And so, Sue, Carl, so excited to have you here today. And Sue, where would you usually like to start? Because I think it, it works better than me doing kind of a reading introduction. Uh, but I usually like to get our guests to just tell us a little bit about themselves from their perspective. And so maybe we'll start there and get you to tell us a little bit about who you are. Sure. So I'm a worldwide life and parent coach as well as an entrepreneurial coach. Um, I do a lot of speaking engagements. I work with clients one-on-one -on -one worldwide. I host online courses. I have a podcast. Um, I do a lot of events like this. I do speaking in public places, but not right now. Um, and I really love to share my message, my thoughts, and really help people to really show up as their best self, shine their light, find themselves, and connect within. So, you know, I think that's my mission is to really help people live their best life, their authentic life in every way possible. I love wow, I, I, I dig that too. And and so Sue, where I think I'd like to start from there to sort of unpack that. And this is something that at least because she's here with me, seen me do yesterday and probably knows I'll continue to do throughout the event. But I'd I would like to go into very first for people is the why people don't. So in other words, you know, when you talk about living your best life possible, and this is based on just your perception or per experience with it. But why do you think so many people struggle with living their best life? Because let's face it, it's not 90% of the world that is living their best life. So I'm curious what, what you see as the obstacle. Why are the challenges so there? So I think it starts from birth. You know, we're, we're born into this world naked and authentic, let's say. And we grow up in a family that has certain belief systems. And so we begin to become conditioned from our parents, how they raise us, what they believe, what they teach us, and what I like to call the platter that we're fed in most families. Not all families, but in the past, I think there was a lot of unconditional raising of children where we weren't really thinking about our belief systems. We were raising our children to behave, show up the way we wanted them to show up. And so I think in, in response to that, as a child, we learn to create uh, boundaries and we learn to create an outside shell to show up and please the outside world, whether it's our parents, our school, what have you, and really protect ourselves. You know, we could be protecting ourselves from the shame of doing something wrong or from getting in trouble or whatever the case might be. So, you know, we have the conditioning from, from childhood. We have societal conditioning as well. You're expected to do this or do that. And then we also have cultural conditioning. So this is how people are 
kind of placed, I would say, into this realm of beliefs and, and forward movement is you go to college, you do this, you do that, you get a good job, you become a doctor, whatever the case may be, whatever you've been fed from your own platter. And this is where we lose track of who we truly are because we're just showing up every day with the mask, so to speak, or the shell to prevent ourselves from actually finding out who we really are. And it happens very young. You know, one one big thing too is abandonment, this mm. fear of being abandoned. If I don't comply to these expectations, are they gonna stop? Well, we have a lot right. of conditional loving going on in families, a lot right. of times as a child. Absolutely. At least, maybe I'm shame. speaking for myself, I don't know. <laughs> Well, and the shame, and we all want to be seen, we all want to be heard, and we all want to be valued. But I think in years past, we lost sight of being seen, heard, and valued for who we truly are, but we become seen, heard, and valued for who we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to show up, if there is even any seeing, hearing, and valuing. And again, I'm talking about you know past generations. I think we're, we're doing a better job, at least I'd like to think so. And I think I'm making an impact in the world and helping parents as well as lots of other people who do this work. But it's how we raise the children. This is where it begins. So true, Sue. Like, it's so true. Because, I mean, we're all grappling really with our inner child. Like, the challenge is if we really sit down and think about it, I'm like, it's not my 50-year-old 50, 50 badass self that's challenged right now. It's my 11-year-old that still shows up in the situation. Right. But your badass self needs to talk to your 11 year old. Like I want, like she wanted the, the mother to do. Exactly. Like, so be the version of your parent that you wish your parent was to yourself, to that version of yourself. Absolutely. And that's how we begin to reconnect with who we truly are. And the only one that can heal us is us. You're absolutely right. We have to nurture that inner child. We have to love that inner child. We have to answer that inner child, show up for that inner child. And I do a lot of work around this. It's it's very powerful for my clients as well as for me. I know. I'm like really <laughs> doing it for myself. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, I just ask you on the parenting side because we have two young children now. So we have uh, three year and three month old Sebastian and three month old Elijah and. Elijah has a, a rare disorder called MCAD. Um, I'm, I, my direction isn't to go with that, but I bring that up because his nurturing, you know, maybe even a little more important because uh, if he doesn't eat meals around the clock, uh, his blood sugar can drop dangerously low. And so it's manageable. But my question is this, I was talking to somebody today and I, I won't bring us, I don't mean to bring us into any area that's sort of controversial, but I was talking to somebody today about the connection that we have when we're that young with our family and our parents. And this person said that they've been doing a lot of studying and it showed that a lot of people that didn't have that connection when they're that young, it shows itself way later in life and in, in very negative ways. And so I was talking about how we chose to breastfeed. And this is why I say I don't want to get into controversy early because I think it's a personal choice. Okay. But we chose to breastfeed. And she said, I think your child will have a connection that not every child has by making that choice because of the connection a mother and child has. And then in addition to that, my girlfriend, as at least we've talked about in the past, uh, does uh, every night we do two stories each for our son. Uh, and it, trust me, <laughs> I'm running it as stories. Like we're at like 160 <laughs> now in a month or something. But anyway, uh, we do story time every night. Um, she did meditation for both, meditated for both of them and did uh, affirmations while they're in her stomach and does prayers with them every night. And I feel like that can only be good. But my question out of all this is, is from what you've seen, is there some truth to the, the connection that we have as children with our parents does it show itself later on in life? I, I think connection is huge. It doesn't have to be done just by breastfeeding. I mean, that is only one small you know, arena and it's just the mother, right? <laughs> so it doesn't have to be done just in that area. So connection is really being with our child, fully present, connecting with them in a way that we're not distracted. It's putting the cell phone down, it's getting rid of the tablets, the TV, the noise around us. And being able to see our child for who they are. This is where, you know, the authentic awareness of who this child is, what this child needs, how we can support this child, the child's emotional needs. You know, perhaps you have a child that is super sensitive. You need to show up for that in a way that supports your child and helps them to thrive. So, you know, I think it can be uh, five minutes to 15 minutes of, you know, if, if people are going to work these days 
of coming home and the reentry process to have that 15 minutes of uninterrupted, un, you know, non-distracted time where we sit with our child and we just be. We listen, we're present. I mean, we don't have to create a conversation. We just have to be with them. Sometimes there is conversation. If you have a teen, maybe even a teen boy, maybe they don't want to talk. So you just sit next to them and be there. And someday they will. Maybe two weeks down the road, they'll start to open up because you're there. You're present. So there's so many, you know, there's hundreds of ways to connect, but it's connecting with the child you have. It's not connecting with the child in your mind or the child that you think you have. So, you know, in your situation with the feeding, that's a really important part of your connection and making sure that your child thrives for real, right? So, you know, these are the things to be aware of as we learn about our kids. If you have a kid that gets hangry, right? They don't eat. And I had one of those. I still have Me one too. of those. I still have one. 26 I think years I old. I one of those. Gets angry. Yeah. <laughs> I can say, I think some of us are one of those. I, I think I am too. But I mean, she used to fall on the floor like with hysteria. And so, you know, we can react or we can bring compassion. And so this is part of connection is bring compassion to your child. Wow, my child's laying on the floor. I wonder what they need from me right now. This is how we show up for the child. Yeah, I, I love that. And I have to add, and at least I know you want to add something, but I'll just add quickly. <laughs> Go ahead. I, love that, I love the idea of, uh, as you mentioned, personalizing it for what the child needs. And, you know, it's it's interesting because I think what I like about what my girlfriend did, and I think she's an, I feel like she's a natural mother. She just seemed to immediately gravitate to this. And, and I feel like it was her calling in some ways. And so, and a lot of people, her friends that have had children, like, you're just like a natural at this. And she doesn't think she is like most people. She's like, no, no, it's just, it's just, I'm doing what I have to do. But what's interesting is that the things I said that she did for her children, that's before she knew their personality, you know, when they're in their belly and everything. But I think those things are probably universally, if you meditate and do affirmation for your children, I think those are probably gonna be, I can't see how those are gonna be bad, but I do like what you're saying about then, once the child, you start to understand what their personality is. Like our son, we had to fill it at the daycare what his personality was and she put shy, sensitive, and hilarious. Because he comes in every, and I just brought him today, and he's, and as soon as we get to daycare, like even before we talk to his soul, he's like, yes. Yes. He's like totally different kid. At home, he's like running around cartwheels. We get there and he becomes instantly shy. And then I drop him off and the teacher's like, Sebastian, did you have a good night? Like so shy. And then we go pick him up in the afternoon and we hear him from down the hall. He's the loudest kid in there. And so knowing that and that he is sensitive as well, he's I'm sure he's an empath. Uh, I think that obviously dictates how we raise him and how, you know, so again, we have to understand that because if we don't, if he's shy like that, you get there in the morning, you go, what are you doing? You're always so hyper. Get in there then it's, you know, it's obviously going to change. It's going to have an effect on him if you're forcing him to not be shy whenever right. maybe that's what he needs at that time in the morning. Anyway, I just wanted to add that I like what you said there because even though I said we did a lot of things early on, and I mean, Shelly did, that I think apply universally, we didn't know their personalities yet. But now we know their personalities. Maybe meditation or affirmations isn't what they need now that we know their personalities. So I, think, far, I think everybody needs that. So yeah. you can't go wrong there. <laughs> and so far, so good. Yeah, I, right. mean, I like the idea you said personalization. Sorry, Elise, I'll hand it over to you. Well, one you of the things. No, no, no. It's perfect because it actually ties in with what Sue's talking about. It's about raising who your child is, not who we want the child to be. And a lot of times... I see with my clients and the families, even though I don't work with a family together, I work with the child individually and then the parent individually because they're individuals. I don't need the parent telling me the version of the child that they think they are because that gets confusing because they're raising a child that they want the child to be as opposed to who the child truly is. And I think that's the first step. And one of the other things that I sort of joke about, but it's true is that we don't need to know, right? So we don't need to know how to grow hair on our heads or boobs as women, but we do need to learn how to love ourselves. We mm -hmm. do need to learn how to recognize who we are and understand the different parts of us. And when a parent recognizes that and helps us recognize it in ourselves, then we become those adults. Because we don't automatically change just because we grow taller. No. Don't you find that when you work with the inner child of an adult is that we just become a grander version of the version that we were five minutes ago? 
Absolutely. And more aware, more conscious, more connected. And I think those of us who are raising children, this is where, sorry, Corey, this is where it begins. Although you've, you know, you've already awakened, but that's where the awakening begins, I think, because we're triggered by our kids, by many things that happen in raising our children that starts to create that questioning about how we were raised or the pain or, you know, whatever. Um, and so instead of repeating the cycles of what we grew up with, you know, in terms of our parents, and again, nothing against our parents, they did the very best they could. I'm sure everyone's parents did out there. So it's really about learning more about how you can heal yourself so that you can show up mm -hmm. in a different way for your children. And that we're just not repeating cycle after cycle after cycle of how we were raised, you know, we're raising children to just be seen and not heard. You know, that was that was my history, you know, so or or whatever it might be. I'm sure everybody has their own script of how they were raised, their own platter, or what they had to believe in and what, you know, the family looked like. And so this is where we need to detach from what we were fed and what really speaks to us. And it takes a lot of work to get to that point. And then we're able to show up in such a different way as the very best model we can be for our children and raising them different from how we were raised. I mean, we need to raise our children how we wanted to be raised, what we needed when we were kids, right? Yes, I love that. Using who you need, who you needed your parents to be for you as the example of who we can be and even raising our own inner child. Yeah. And our kids wake us up. So my oldest is my greatest awakener and she had issue with uh, love. She didn't think she was lovable. And the more this came up and the more we dissected it, it was my go-to, you know, as a child. Mm. It's the third one down, you know, I was trouble. <laughs> we won't go there, but um, <laughs> it, uh, you know, that was the theme is I must not be lovable. I'm always in trouble and I'm always the black sheep and I'm always doing this and that and the other. So the children in front of us are also mirror images for us, you know, or mirrors for us to look inside of ourselves and look at why things in our kids are making us feel uncomfortable or different or whatever to be able to look at the raising that you know we experienced and the conditions that we experienced and how we thrived or perhaps didn't thrive so looking at them as a mirror almost yes. right yep. i mean as a reflection of what is it bringing up in me right that i don't like right right so it's actually a gift it's a huge gift because they can show us unresolved issues they can show us the inner child wounds they can show us, you know, maybe something so small, but it's big as, you know, when we spilled milk on the floor, we, we got screamed at. So every time our child spills the milk and kids spill milk, you know, that's part of who they are. It's the necessary, you know, opportunity. So this might trigger us. And when mm -hmm. it does, it's an opportunity to, for us to say, what does this say about me? It's not about the child. That's what they do, you know? So these are wake up calls for sure to, again, flip your script, to mm -hmm. be able to see yourself in a different way, to connect with who you really are, what you really believe now, not, not what you were told to do and believe. So I have a question that mm -hmm. I'm gonna pose in some ways to uh, both of you, because something you said, Sue, and something I know um, that Elise has said in the past as well, and so Oprah, which I think she got from uh, Maya Angelou, uh, said, uh, when are you doing better? And Elise talks often about um, we're all doing what we, what, we, we, what we can with what we already know. And the so best we know we can with who we are and what we know. Right. <laughs> exactly. And so here's my question, though, out of that. Because on one hand, I agree with that completely. Um, and I, you know, I, I never try to judge people based on decisions they make or things they do, because again, I realize that you know, they're doing what they know. And it's even like uh, Shelly, my girlfriend says, hurt people. People that were hurt tend to hurt people. Um, and that's not saying it's right. It just seems to be a pattern. As you said, what people are conditioned with, then they tend to sort of do the same thing. My question of all that, though, is where, to, within all that, and I'd love to get both your thoughts on this, where does personal responsibility lie in the sense that, okay, so if I don't know any better right now, and so I'm not doing any better, what is my responsibility within that to learn to learn better so that I do better? Meaning I'm not judging the person, but do they have a responsibility to start trying to do better then? 
if I'm not judging them, but I'm also looking and saying, well, we know that's not right for you to push that old lady into the street. <laughs> so at what point is it the responsibility for a person to, to learn and know better? I just like to get your thoughts on this. You know, that's a great question. I, really I think, question. yeah, it, and it's a, it's a tough question to answer, but I think the best I can say about that is every day, every moment of every day on this earth is an opportunity for us to do the best we can in that moment. And so, you know, I always talk to parents about being gentle with themselves or, you know, individuals, because every day we're trying to do the very best we can. And some days it may be repeating cycles. Other days, it may be more awareness. Other moments, maybe, wow, look at me, I just did this, you know, that was so great. I think, you know, for us, we have a personal responsibility to ourselves. You know, we have a personal responsibility to grow, to thrive, to, to bring more conscious awareness every day. I mean, this is a gift. Life is a gift. It's, you know, it's not to be taken for granted. It's to be lived in each moment as best we can. So, you know, I think, um, I'm working with an organization called Connect You. Hopefully, I can share this. Uh, Connect University, and it's really about all of this. It's about helping people connect with themselves, you know, all over the world in a way that serves them. We're going to be actually teaching people how to do this, and so it's a worldwide organization that we're just getting off the ground. Um, and I'm one of the founders, so I'll share with you guys um, individually as well. But I, I think that teaching people how to connect is is also a a responsibility you know that doesn't mean we step into you know someone's life and that you know screamed at their kid and tell them you are doing it wrong but maybe we show up with some compassion maybe they push somebody in the street and we say wow you know i don't know what you say to that but you must be having a really bad day you know to have harmed this you know this person um so coming to people's rescue and you know offering compassion, I think is all of our responsibilities, kindness and compassion, but certainly bringing that home, the kindness and compassion and the love for ourselves, which I find you know, every day in my work, people don't necessarily love themselves. So it's really hard to hold yourself accountable and responsible if you can't find the love first. Absolutely. I, I love that. And at least I wanna pose the question to you as well. And the re and I just want to also reiterate, the reason I asked this too is because I don't ever want, because I was that person, by the way, that didn't know better. And because I didn't know better, I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. And so I didn't try to do better. But my always my fear is if somebody hears that, like, and I'll, I'll use the Oprah one, not Elise's, but uh, when you know better, you do better. If I hear somebody say that and I say, well, sorry, it's all I know. That it, like what I'm saying, it would be easy for me at that time in my life to kind of go, well, that's all I know, sorry. You can't expect more because this is this is what I know. This is what I'm going to do. I guess what I'm getting at is I never would want somebody to not strive to go bigger or better because they think, well, as as we say, you know, that's all I know, so that's who I am. And that's why I asked the question because I'm just curious again on the personal responsibility. And I know we can't say to somebody else, you need to learn to do better because they're not going to do it. I mean, it's like you tell somebody to quit smoking just because you want them to quit smoking doesn't mean they're going to. So yeah, and if somebody tells you to do something that you're not ready to do, it's not going to work either. So just put yourself in the same shoes. That's exactly. what I do. And that's why I asked the question, but at least I'd love to get your take on it as well. <sighs> okay. So I love your response, Sue. Um, yeah. And, and it's, and it's a big question. It's a really big question. And I, my response, the first response that I would have is to check in with yourself and with myself. Am I judging? Because it's the judgment of a situation that's the most toxic in the beginning. So to look at somebody and recognize that they have an opportunity to feel better because when we feel better, we do better and we be better, right? So to look at somebody and we'll use the example of pushing an old lady in the street, which seems extreme, but you just never know. And to look at that person and say, well, what's wrong with that person? There must be something wrong and he's evil and bad and start that dialogue that is just as toxic as pushing that lady in the street. And we don't recognize it as such because it's a physical action. But what we say and what we think is energy that we're actually putting into the world and fertilizing globally. We're, we're fertilizing the butterfly effect. So the first step would be with self. 
It's not about what this person's doing. Is this person ready? Does this person feel like he or she deserves to feel better? It's about how are we responding to this situation right now? That's the role that we can play. Then we can move into, you must have had a bad day, or is there anything I can do to help? Or, mm -hmm. But that judgment, we don't recognize as being so incredibly toxic. So powerful. I love that. One other thing that I wanted to add is that I think we live in a world where many people are disconnected. They're disconnected to the self. They're disconnected to communities. They can't find you know, their people, tribe, whatever you want to say, mm -hmm. or they just haven't lived a connected life where they feel that bond, that love, I fit in, you know, I know I'm accepted. And so you know, that's part of this you know, new venture I'm, I'm bringing to life is really helping people to have connections, to have community, to have a place of support, love, kindness, because I think we grow in that environment. We don't grow with a lot of hate and a lot of negativity. And as you, you know, beautifully said, at least judgment, judgment, you know, and we're very, we're very judgy people, right? In our world. Um, so, you know, we judge ourselves and then we judge everybody else. So bringing, you know, that love, that community, that connection, that compassion everywhere is really going to make a difference for people to feel connected and not so detached. Uh, if I can, I just want to bring up an example. I have a beautiful little client. She's nine years old and so precocious and so aware. And we had a conversation about feeling alone, right? Just using this concept of feeling disconnected. And she felt alone, even when she wasn't alone she would feel alone. She felt just by herself. And we have to have a conversation and shift perspective and understanding and awareness. And I do use EFT, so I get to go you know, deep into that subconscious. And she, I could see the shift in her. And she had this like aha moment, even at nine, recognizing she really wasn't alone. Like where this feeling of being alone came from had nothing to do with her physical surroundings, had nothing to do with how many people love and adore her. It was something within herself where she felt alone and abandoned. And I think that that's an important thing to be aware of is that you can't be loved enough to love yourself. You can't be surrounded by enough people to feel connected if you don't feel connected. Right. So Start it goes it's so deep and there's so many twists and turns to why someone does something. I mean, think about ourselves. Why do sometimes I'm like, really? Like, uh, did I just do that again? So it's not as easy as she shouldn't have, he shouldn't have pushed or she shouldn't have pushed the old lady in the street. That's a symptom. Yeah. And behavior is a form of communication. The depths of it are, you know, as you said, what we need to get to. Where is it coming from? And that's what you're so good at, Sue. And I Thank think that you. that's key, you know, is helping somebody recognize, you know, where's the root of this? Where's the real root? All this other stuff, side effects, symptoms of, but let's get to the root so those symptoms change. Yeah. And it's amazing when you do what you say, mm -hmm. for sure. Well, it's, you know, I, I will say that, and, and again, this is just personal experience, but for me, and I, we talked about this yesterday. We talked about do you have to get to your uh, lowest point to uh, have a have a sort of a rebirth or a shift? And for me, it was the opposite that I actually discovered uh, this thing that, that I discovered my calling, and it actually was kind of like the opposite where I discovered this gold, and I'm like, I want more of this. Like I went to work act actually the day after I started finding my why. I'll never forget. Somebody said, "Did you meet a girl last night or something? You've got a little jump in your step." And it was because I found my calling. And so what I find intriguing is that for the people that find that, all of a sudden they want to do better. They want to know more. They want to know better. And again, it's not a judgment who the people haven't found it because I just think they haven't discovered it yet. But for me, if somebody asked me when the shift came where I wanted to do better and know more because I said there was a time when I didn't know that what I didn't know, it started. The minute that I discovered my why, I started getting so excited and on live and, fi and fire. I wanted to learn everything I could about the world, everything I could about other people. And it just opened up this whole thing where I wanted to know better and do more. But that's why I want to ask because we also have to recognize there's a large percentage of people that don't know there is any better to do. You know, they don't know that there's more or different. And again, it's even a judgment to say what's better or not, but I'm just saying they don't even know there is a different way to live. But they have an opportunity to feel better about who they are. Exactly. And yeah, period. I, what, and whatever they do with that, will show up. 
hundred percent. And people have said to me all the time, what, you know, like, why should I care? What, like, what's the benefit of finding my calling or my why or what have you? And I said, the challenge I've said to people, the challenge is you don't know it until you experience it. But for me, and this is my explanation of it, is that I said, if you've ever liked Christmas, I start there usually. If you like Christmas or your kid likes Christmas, somebody you know likes Christmas. Do you remember what it's like when they run down the stairs to see that gift, the gifts that arrived or whatever they're running down for Santa, the morning of Christmas, whatever it is, that's how I feel every day when I walk down the stairs. And I jump up out of bed and I have this like fire in my belly that I always say, nobody seems to be able to extinguish the fire. And I can never go back behind the curtain and unknow, as, as Elise said, unknow what I know. I know how I feel now. I can never not want to feel like this ever again. So the crappy part is until you feel that way, you don't know what you're missing. And so I understand why, because I didn't know why somebody would not know that they'd want to know that feeling or have that feeling because they don't know what the feeling feels like. And so that's why I want to ask you. I know it's a deep question, but when does a person, you know, where, when does it, it kick in that a person should want to know more or do more? And in some cases, because they, they're not ready yet, I guess. They haven't discovered that lowest of lows or the potential highest of highs. Or Sue, how do you help your clients recognize that they have enough, that they are of value and that they matter enough to be able to find that and share that with the world? I think that that's, yeah, that's a great step, question. Right? Um, the entrepreneurs I support who are coaches, um, you know, sometimes question their credibility. You know, am I credible? Will people buy, you know, buy from me, so to speak, you know, my service um, if I'm working on all this stuff and and we're all working on all this stuff. You know, we all have stuff that we continue to work on because when we stop doing the work, we don't, you know, when we're stop, we stop growing. I think we're gone. You know, it's the end of life. And so we talk about how it's doing a disservice to not show up, especially as you're going through your own challenges to be there for people. So, you know, that's one of the things. But the second piece of this is there's usually a block that's holding them back. And it usually has to do with, you know, the connection to themselves. And so, again, unless we can bring the love home and fill our hearts in a way that makes us have the passion, you know, and connect to the passion and feel ignited every day. I'm like you, kid at Christmas. Um, you know, we, we can't really show up fully present for our clients because we've got all the stuff going on in our head that's taking us away. So it's really, you know, detaching from all that we were taught. It's really, you know, unpacking the backpack. And mm -hmm. as we unpack it, leaving all the pieces, and I like to do a backpack, an external backpack, leaving all the pieces on the side of the road that don't serve us anymore, that don't make us feel the connection and love for ourselves so that we can show up for every client that we serve out there. And, you know, once, once we do these exercises, you know, it's not a one and done, but once we work through this from an entrepreneurial standpoint and connect, you know, and find some of the blocks, people see how incredible the process is because they start attracting, you know, I believe in the law of attraction. And mm -hmm. so they start attracting what's continuing to serve their growth. Love it. And so here's a comment that I'd love to get your take on as well. But I mean, again, both of you or Sue, uh, first of all, we, so had a you can take this. <laughs> first of all, we had a comment by uh, before the comment I want to mention is just uh, I know it's Marnie who said, uh, hi, Corey and Elise, wishing you a fabulous day and Blue Talks event. Hello. And uh, but then and I don't know who put this because uh, the, the challenge sometimes on the back end is it doesn't show the name. So I might be able to find this, but it's easiest way is just put it on the screen. But the comment was, and this goes back to us talking about probably my child being sensitive, uh, but a highly sensitive child deserves a highly sensitized parent and vice versa. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. What, what do you, do you think that that's a good mix? Do you think that they, that's what they were put on earth and deserved? So the, the parent they asked for, or do you think, I, I just love to get your take on it. Yeah, over. that's, that's a, that feels like a loaded question because we are not necessarily sensitive, you know, by nature. And so the expectation already on the parent to be that sensitive person the child needs when that's not who you are is, again, taking you away from who you might be, who you, you know, authentically are in this world. And I think more importantly, every child that I believe that comes to us or through us is here for our own growth. You know, so, for example, I mean, both my kids have awakened me in incredible ways. But I do have to say my oldest was my greatest awakener, mirroring things to me so that I could learn and grow myself. And so, you know, the sensitive child is here, you know, or the, all the sensitive children 
all the children are here as their unique selves showing up for the parent in a way that continues to help the parent grow and thrive. That doesn't mean that you're suddenly going to be sensitive or you're going to read a book and find a way to have all sorts of sensitive tactics. It means that you're going to find a way to create the conditions for your particular child, the sensitive child, to grow in a way that serves them, that supports them, that doesn't change who they are, but honors who they are. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of labels. You know, if our children are sensitive, there's a way to respond to that. Or our children are shy. When we walk around saying, you know, oh, everybody watch out, you know, this one's shy and this, this child of mine is sensitive in front of the kids, which oh, parents sometimes do. Don't even you know, get me started yeah, on that one. A, you know, it has a, such a negative impact because- We then, can hear you, you know, like everybody right. can hear what you're saying. Now they're labeling right. themselves, which is yeah. like, oh. Maybe right. they're just being that way. Right now, this is the way I'm being. Right. And in two weeks, it could change. But when we start to label things and, you know, put a yellow sticky note on the child's back, they're wearing it. So, you know, I think we have to be careful with the language that we use in, you know, in looking at our children and look at the conditions we can create to help that unique child. Because whether they're sensitive or not, <clears throat> they're unique. Each child on this earth is unique and has a unique beautiful soul and package of strengths and gifts to to you know open at the time that's right for that child so your job as a parent is to show up and be there to help that child open those gifts in their timing not yours and we also that's can't so beautiful we also can't wrap them as we have learned in bubble either right. in the sense that right. Like, with it, for example, uh, first of all, as humans, I think, you know, we're going to do those things that you said we shouldn't do. We're going to, I mean, not every one of us, but some of us are going to sure. put that label on and then go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Like my, one of the things my girlfriend said, and again, it's hard. How do you tell somebody else they can't do it? But my girlfriend, and she's open about me sharing stuff like that. We're both open people. But she said, uh, I don't want, I don't want us calling her son a bad boy. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to get the idea of bad boy. Maybe, you know, what you did was wrong, but not you are a bad boy. And she was really against that. And then so she made sure my mother knew that. And then my mother made sure my grandmother knew that. But, and it's because then my grandmother did say, you're such a bad boy today. And then my girlfriend, and my mom was like, no, you're not supposed to say that to him. But my point is, is that it's still going to happen. We can't wrap him in a bubble. And the point about the shy kid, we don't know where he learned that. We didn't call him shy. But he comes, he goes to the school and he says, I'm shy. So I don't know, did the teacher say, oh, you're such a shy boy? Or did he hear it on a video? Like, we don't know where he came from. So the point is we realize we can't wrap him in that bubble, but what we can do is make sure we're not reinforcing it. And if we do slip and say it, we just make we make, make sure we don't slip and do it the second time. Or we explain to him, you know, that, mm -hmm. that you shouldn't have said that. Or I think actually that right there, that's, that's can cool. you imagine, like, let's all, I mean, we all have parents and we're all parents right now. Can you imagine if our parents came to us when they said something that now is probably rooted in our like, okay, consciousness or belief system. And they came and said, Hey, wait a second. You know what? I just thought about this and I just want to come and let you know that the way that I responded was because I was uncertain. I wasn't sure about how to handle it. I was scared. Like, could you imagine if we just came out with it or, or our parents came out with it to us like that in and of itself would be such a game changer but i feel like as parents and our parents tried to be so perfect in some kind of a way that we were sheltered so when we have these feelings as humans or our inner child has these still has these feelings we feel it's wrong because we were never shown that it's a process and we're all human and sometimes parents say things that they really didn't mean because they were having a hard time too like i think there's Absolutely. a gift in that there's a huge gift in that and making mistakes you know as i'll call them are important because we are human and we're not perfect. We're all imperfectly perfect. This is how we're supposed to be. So, you know, if we yell at our child or we call our child, a, you know, bad child, bad, you know, bad boy, whatever the case may be, stepping up and owning it yes. and repairing it and showing a child how important it is, you know, also doing it, but showing a child how important it is to, to take hold of our mistakes, mm -hmm. to own our mistakes and to repair the relationships by saying something, like you said. I mean, if our parents came back to us even now, right? I know, be like, some of the stuff. Oh my gosh, my mom's oh, such a good like, I know, that was crazy, uh, crazy good. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think that, I, you know, I teach parents that you have to remember you're human, you're a human being. And we can't beat ourselves up for the things that we wish we didn't do. All we can do is repair, repair, and model. 
So repair, own it, apologize, so that your children learn when they screw up, they need to repair, own, and you know, apologize if that's what it's called for. And so also, we get to explore our feelings that way. Like it felt, it felt badly when I yelled at you. Like I didn't even like how I felt. So the next time when they have a moment like that, they can sit and go, "Well, I didn't like how I felt when I responded that way either." And how and feeling feeling good is like really something that's a better way of going. So how can we? work together and feel good about it so we can both feel good and have and, and have the intentions manifest absolutely so it's such a learning piece and so it really isn't a mistake it's like a little gift right yeah well and i, I want to ask you guys a really big question i'm gonna ask both you guys and pose this mm. question but um it's probably bigger than my other one that you guys said was a big uh -oh. question. <laughs> but, uh, but i will show uh the person that mentioned that about the sensitized sensitive children and sensitized parents uh mentioned Oh, one sec here. Uh, she said, and it wasn't Sue that was misunderstood because it was me that actually repeated it. Sue didn't even read the comment. Uh, may have misunderstood my comment. I was supporting what you're saying and not labeling. Uh, I meant that the child deserves to be nurtured and supported in the way that's best for them. As you said, the child wakes up uh, the parent. So yeah, mm -hmm. I wanted to clarify that because context is everything, right? And sure. but I, I brought it up because I wanted it to be a conversation point because I think it's an important thing to mention, um, the idea of, um, you know, should this person be that or should we you know again if i'm if i have a child that's sensitive but i'm not maybe that's a good thing maybe that's a good combo because i'm uh, i'm learning to be more sensitive and maybe they're actually teaching me uh or i'm actually teaching them that you don't always maybe have to be super sensitive so i mean maybe we learn from each other but here's my question out of that and no any question i ask it's with love i just like to bring this up because i think this is a thing that we see asked a lot and where i have two people that uh are really in touch with both uh, their feelings and also how uh, we connect with people. What about the people that would say, look, because now we have generations we can look at, but would say, okay, previous generations. So for example, my grandfather's generation um, or even my mother's, but let's say my grandfather's generation, you know, he went to school in grade three and, you know, they hit him on the knuckles with the ruler and uh, they spanked him and they said, don't be so stupid. And uh, he rode down the hill and toboggan with no helmet. And he rode out on the bike in the street and just missed cars by this much. And his argument would be, and he passed away since, but his argument would be, you people are too soft. You know, I grew up perfect. And he, he, he was rare situation, but everybody loved this man. He I loved everybody, never had a kind word for anybody, never judged anybody. But his thing would be, I went through all that, all the stuff you're saying not to do. My parents never talked to me about this, never talked about my feelings. I didn't cry, all this other stuff. And I see kids today that are worse than me and they had all that stuff. What's the point of it? And so I just I know that's a big question, but I know a lot of people yeah. think that like we have a generation now, this would be the argument they'd make, that doesn't seem to be any better, let's say, or worse, but any better than the generation that didn't have all these great things and have time to talk and 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 consider their feelings and all that kind of stuff. What would you guys say to that? Um, well, I think the first thing is we it's not better or worse, it's different. Mm -hmm. And this is a different generation. We are in different times and we will continue to be. I mean, I hate to think what the next generation of, you know, of kids will look like, but you have a lot of screens. I mean, you have a lot of different things that kids didn't have, you know, at least I didn't have when I grew up and I'm sure, you know, your, your grandfather. Um, I, mean, I can remember my mom opening the door and shooing us out and closing it and locking it. And like, you know, at the end of the day, you come in for dinner, you know, it was a long day outside. Um, but I think that it doesn't mean that those that were raised in different conditions aren't, you know, good or aren't bad. I mean, I don't really like those words or we're better or worse. I just think we know more now and we can do more. So to circle back, you know, to what was brought up at the beginning by you, Elise, I, I think that this is really the important piece is we can bring about a different raising of this generation one where this generation is not disconnected from their authentic self, you know, where we could look at previous generations and say there are, I mean, I know that's the work I do. So I know there's a lot of people, and at least you probably know too, that are, are disconnected from themselves. And why is that? And are in therapy. I mean, years of therapy. I, you know, I think that that's common now, whereas when I was a kid, my mom always said, I wish I could go to therapy, but you know, people didn't do that then, you know, God forbid. So she would go to the library to read a book, how to raise me. Well, there was no book on how to raise me, trust me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that we have to take cues from our kids. We walk the path with this generation. 
And what I mean by that is we walk side by side, like two footprints in the sand next to one another, not the parent dragging the child or the child dragging the parent. You know, in some cases that may be, but really equal partners in life to help each other grow, learn, and thrive. And that doesn't mean the parent doesn't have, um, you know, more control, we might say. I mean, we can't really control another person, but in terms of boundaries and, and teaching and those kinds of elements. But we, we are in a different time and we have to rise to that. There's far more consciousness discussed in the world, far more awareness, mindset, meditation, and, you know, quiet moments where people are really practicing that deeper connection to themselves. And I think that is one of the most beautiful things that we, in this generation, raising children, maybe our kids are, you know, young adults, but we can still bring it to life and help this generation to, to thrive by being themselves, really connected to themselves. And Lisa, I want to throw you this question as well. And I'll just add to that point, So One of the things I do like seeing, I mean, it's good or bad, depending on how you view it, probably. And again, no good or bad, but I mean, it's you could look at it as a positive or a negative thing. But, um, you know, I find that now parents, for example, fathers, I'll use fathers as the example, are a lot more nurturing with their children than I ever saw when I was growing up. So for example, my father, I don't know if he ever changed the diaper, ever. My grandfather did change my diaper. I don't know if he's ever changed his got my mother's bike diaper because he was always working. Now, in fairness, they were out working all day. Sure. They weren't there to change the diaper, but that's another point, right? They weren't there to change the diaper. And, um, you know, my girlfriend's always like, change the diaper, would you? And I don't have that excuse of, well, my father didn't change the diaper. I probably have it, but it won't work. And so my point is, it's not abnormal for me to have the kids and go out for a walk. And, and people see me with the two, uh, not the two right now because of breastfeeding, but it will be soon in a stroller walking two kids. I never saw that when I was growing up of parents. If he saw it, it was like abnormal. Like, oh my God, you see, there's a guy that was had the kids out today. It was just very rare. So maybe that's an example of what you're talking about, about us having more connection now because mm -hmm. we didn't see that growing up, or I didn't. Anyway, at least I want to throw it over to you. Well, that's really interesting. So there's a couple of points that I'd like to touch on. And one is that I lived in Norway, actually, for almost nine years, and my son is half Norwegian. So I was married to a Norwegian. I was I had the gift of being able to give birth and raise my son for the for, first for few formative years in, in an environment where fathers took a year off to be with their child. So it really depends on where you were brought up and where you're looking to see, because it really is I mean, it just depends on where you're living and what's the norm, I guess you would say. So there are cultures where the father and the mother are just as equal caretakers and parents, they have the same role. So that being said, but I also wanna bring something up that we don't talk about that much, evolution, right? Mm -hmm. um, there was evolution at a time when we could physically see the shift I mean, and I'm not going to bring religion into it. Let's just talk about the science side of it. You know, apes and then, you know, you're on all fours and then you're standing up straight and then you're hairy and then you're not. And all of a sudden we evolve right into humans. There's an evolution to things, whatever that looks like. Well, we're still evolving, but we're evolving in a way that is not something that we can see in real time. We're evolving to different levels and our consciousness is evolving. So the children that are coming into this world right now are coming in with a different understanding, a different connection to, you know, we talk about connecting to who we are. It's not who we are as humans in this, in this vehicle. It's who we are connected to where we came from. All of this knowledge that all three of us have are not like in this little head of ours. I mean, we are connecting to a station which we we have, you know, a signal to, and this information is coming through us, right, as a vehicle. And so the evolution is continued. It's just not as as tangible as we see it. So the way that we're connecting and being raised is because we know innately with each within ourselves that there's something more. We're something more than just this. So maybe our grandparents and our great grandparents were born in that time and their evolution wasn't such that they had this connection so strong as we do now. If, if that makes I sense. That. I love that. So we're still evolving, but we're evolving in dimensions that are that are more visceral than verbal or physical. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have, I believe, autisms and, and, and same-sex same lovers. And I mean, there's a lot of shifting and changing going on right now to kind of, you know, 
pull us out of some mainstream way of thinking and some norm. So it doesn't fully apply to what you're saying, but it does in the sense that I think that what Sue said is that we have we're we're in a different time, right? And and we're really a product of, I mean, look at our society now globally. We're all products of how we were or weren't nurtured at a certain time in our lives. Yeah. So, so if we have a collective and a global world of beings and we're not a global world of well-beings, we're going to have issues as groups, political, religious, and or otherwise. But if every one single individual becomes a well-being in and of themselves, then every time we connect, we come together. I love that. As a world of well-beings. Yeah. Absolutely. So, true. so on that note, um, we are. We do have to wind down. There's never enough time, by the way, Sue. Uh, you'll probably see that now, but also we see it every interview we do. Um, but Sue, I mean, the most important question, we have probably about a minute and a half left just to give you guys a timeline because then I want to share one quick thing and then we got to bring our next guest right up. But Sue, um, where can people find you? How can they learn more? Um, thank you, by the way, for being willing to tackle those questions. I know those are really big questions. I mean, that last one was a bigger question than I've asked the guests in probably years. So thank you for being willing to tackle that. Sure. Uh, but where can people find you and all the great work you're doing and how can they connect with you? Sure. Um, my website is www.suedecaro.com. Most of my social media, all of my social media is just my name, Sue DeCaro. And um, you can also email me at sue at suedecaro.com. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, support you in any way that I can to help you move forward. Awesome. Well, Sue, this has been an absolute pleasure. I'm sure you would agree. You. And uh, I, thank I have a quick you. question, though. Okay. Before we go, though, okay. what is this? The Connect that you're talking? It's called Connect Global. Or what did you say? Connect University. Is yeah, that something let's, that let's we can find out offline. more about? Yep. Let's take that offline. I can't really uh, share the details of it, but I'd love to have a conversation with both of you uh, in the next couple of weeks, if we could, to discuss it. Absolutely. Awesome. And I have your website correct here, right? Yes, that's me. Okay, perfect. And I got your email in there as well. And so we'll watch for comments. You can do likewise. And again, Sue, I thank you. I uh, salute you, honor you, and uh, we'll call it a to be continued. Great. Thank you. Great Thanks. seeing Bye. you again. Great to see you. Have a great you day. Too. You, you too. too. So we have our next guest coming up right away. Perfect. Uh, I want to. I've got to tell you, can you just take me off for a second? I have to say, I'm in Florida, but it's a little chilly, so I need to grab a sweater. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'll take you off and then I'll, I'll share what I was going to share and then we'll bring our next. Perfect. Episode. All right. Okay. Thanks. See you guys in a minute. Okay. So, uh, what I want to share, uh, I just thought it'd be a good time to do this. But um, what I always do when we run these events is I always like to uh, do some giveaways. And so, what I usually do, because I think it's the easiest way, is to get people to comment and if you comment below uh, and this works by the way even if you don't know you're supposed to comment so some people get lucky and comment and then end up getting a gift but uh, basically if you put comments in the comment section this week then what we'll do is we will um, put the names in for everybody that made a comment this week and essentially we do a draw for different prizes and uh, depending on uh, like last time around I think we ended up having 25 books total offered so we were able to give almost everybody a book and then I ended up topping it up so that everybody got a book so you never know how it's going to play out uh, but if you put a comment below if you may if you already put a comment whatever that looks like then uh, you get your name in the draw for a chance to win one of a certain number of books and so I thought I'd show you guys the books and then uh, one of my um, clients offered up a book as well to one of her books uh, so and we may have others offered up during the week, but either way, uh, the Blue Talks, uh, volume one, uh, what I want to do is I want to put up three of those books for offers. So uh, three people will get a copy of that book sent to them, us paying for shipping and everything else. Um, and then the second book is my book called The Book of Why and How. Uh, this book here, I've been, it's the weird book. It was written, started writing it four years ago, or actually it released four years ago as a self-published book. Then it made its way to a publisher. It had two crowdfunding campaigns. And here we are now. It's considered just a new release book because it was re-released with Morgan James Publishing. And, uh, and this book is the book I felt that I've been working towards for years writing. And what I love about this book is, and I think it's because of the nature of find, helping people find their why, is la anytime I've done the, the giveaway for this book, if I send out five copies, I have two or three send me saying, you know, I'm so grateful this book came, it was the right time, and here's what it helped me do. And if you look actually today on 
my Facebook page. Uh, I got to make sure that I put it onto, accepted it onto my timeline. But uh, somebody wrote, and they were one of the winners last time, that after all these years of not finding their why, they wanted to thank this book, credit this book, and Simon Sinek who, if you guys know Simon Sinek from Start With Why, that's a pretty good company to be in. Um, she said, I want to thank uh, you guys for helping me find my why. And I don't say this is a me ink thing, but I say it because this is a labor of love and I love giving away this book. And so this book, like I said, was the book that I've been working towards for a lot of years. And it's all built around the idea that before I found my why, I wasn't super conscious. I wasn't super, uh, I wasn't as passionate as I am right now. I don't need to drink any coffee. I've drank two coffee in my entire life. This is me every day I wake up and this, you know, me finding my why is how it happened. So, um, that's why I wrote this book because I wanted other people to find it. But yet I also thought that wasn't enough because I know people that have found their why that need more than that. And that's where the end how comes in. So that's a bit about that book. Uh, the blue talks book, I didn't have to tell you as much about because you guys are involved in blue talks. You're watching it happen. You hear us talk about the book more often. So I'm going to offer up five copies of my book as well for draw. And then the last book as of now or for now is a book by Frankie Picasso. And the book is called midlife mojo how to get through the midlife crisis and emerge as your true self. And she said, in essence, this is a book, this book is a prescription for change and is the perfect fit for changing one's mindset. So that's all obviously also uh, great and timely because we're doing an event about flipping your script, which is in a lot of ways about mindset. So that's the book that Frankie offered up. So that's what's that, five, eight, nine books and we'll see if it keeps continuing. Uh, with a weird number like that, I'll probably top up one more if nobody else offers up a book. And I don't expect anybody to ever offer up a book, but at least you would agree, I think. It seems to happen. We have guests on that will say, hey, I want to offer a book or two as well. Last time around, um, Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank, uh, I par purchased five of his book to give away. And then Dr. Alan Leica decided to give away five of his books. And so that's why I said last time we had, I think, I don't know, 25 books that get given away. Uh, but books, you know, the power of reading, I just think it's such a powerful thing that some people haven't discovered yet. And if they get a free book in the mail, they might say, well, frig it, I'll read this book. Or uh, they understand the power of reading and it's the next book in their, on their shelf. Well, so, I missed, I didn't, I did miss the whole book thing because I just popped back in and I didn't hear what you were talking about. But um, since we were talking with Sue DeCaro, we were talking about families and parenting. I do have a children's book out that we can talk about. It is more of a conceptual work of art and it's all about self concept and it's called I Already Am. So we can talk about for any parents out there that have young children, or it's really a children's book for adults, I would say too. It brings about awareness of we're going to raise the child. Our, we're going to see our child as who that child is as opposed to who we want that child to be and recognize that our children are already exactly who they need to be. So that's something that we could talk about as well. It's available on Barnes & Noble and Amazon, so I'm not sure where you were, but I'd be happy to offer that book. Well, I, I, I basically said that um, <laughs> each time around when we do these events, we tend to do some prizes. And I said, really, at the end of the day, at the bare minimum, if you comment on the link, I go and track that all up and then we'll do a draw for people with the book. And then I just said that I, I'm offering up five copies of my book of why, three copies of the Blue Talks book, and then Frankie Picasso offered up one of her books. If you want to, I'll make a deal, at least. If you want to offer one of yours, I'll buy two more. So then- uh, I mean, I'll offer three. How about that? It's up to you. But okay, so there you go. There's 12 chances to win books. So we'll- there you we'll go. Leave it at that for now. I just want to mention that before I forget. But I did say, at least I've changed the way around. I mean, I love the idea of saying people have to say a certain word and all that. But then I feel bad when I see like there's five people that didn't say the word and they miss out. So I just feel if you comment, as long as it doesn't get overboard. But at the same time, the great part is you're limited to the number of books. So if there's 12 books and 100 people comment, then we're going to put the 100 names in and we're going to draw 12 in. Perfect. So, and also, we, if you're a parent, then that would be good to put in the comment as well to know that, you know, you'd be interested in this children's book I already am, which is very, very powerful. Awesome stuff. So having said all that, now without further delay, I'm going to bring our next guest onto the screen. Uh, so Joanne, I'm going to ask you, uh, terrible that I have to ask, but I want to make sure I don't butcher last names. Is it Wenner? It is. Okay. It is. Yes. Thought I I was going to say, I used to be in sports, and sometimes they'd announce my name, and it would be Joanne Wiener, and I would just cringe. Um, so I'm really glad the rock star Adam Wiener's out there, because he really gave me that part of me back for all those times. <laughs> I love it. And so, jo Joanne, uh, you've probably been to the backstage and got to see uh, at least for a little bit. So yes. uh, great. So you can introduce yourself to each other if you want. But Hello. I nice to meet you officially. Wonderful, Wonderful to meet you, Elise. 
Thank awesome. you. Great to be here and great to have you here. Thank you for spending your time. There's so many choices these days of where you can spend your precious time and energy. So I know Corey and I both appreciate you being here. Well, thank, thank you. you. I, I can see it looks like I have a plant growing out of my head there. It looks I good. like it. Yeah. Like all different parts of you. Yeah. All these things happen for a reason. So, yeah. Lynn, uh, where we usually like to start, because again, I, I find it's better than me reading a bio. I'm not a big, you know, read a, uh, three paragraph bio type thing and people are watching me read. Uh, so where we usually like to start is just to get you to tell us a little bit about who you are for those viewers, listeners who might be discovering you for the very first time. Yes, I, I think of all of us as evolutionary beings. Um, so I've had many iterations in this lifetime myself of who I have been and, um, you know, where my career paths went and everything else. So I am a holistic coach, which is kind of a conglomeration of everything that I've been before. And I'm also, I also do a lot of work um, in coaching. It's a holistic, my coaching is holistic. I think the thing that informs it most is the spiritual aspect. Um, and that's brought into everything I do. So it's, you know, non-denominational, has nothing to do with that except from your heart essence and um, at least you touched on this before, where you connect, you know, how you connect with what is. And I love John O'Donohue always says that our body is within our soul. The soul essence is much bigger. The body could never contain it. It's all around us. So that's what I always think about. And that's that's where I start with people. And that's where we go. And it's always um, it's hard for me to prescript how anyone's journey is going to be because I don't know what's going to show up. And so that's how we journey along. And I have three, six month, 12 months programs. I speak. Um, COVID has brought me the gift of time to write. So I've been writing a lot. And so I'll be publishing some also in the coming year. That's very exciting. And as I said, it's continuing to evolve. I've been a project manager for Fortune 1000 or Fortune 100 banks. I've been a project manager in diabetes care for an international company, also took on their HR lead role there. Um, so mother of seven, many iterations. So Whoa, <laughs> maybe go. you should have started with that girl. <laughs> <laughs> so I enjoyed the biggest accolade right there, mother <laughs> of seven. seven. Forget anything else that you just said, like really. How old is your oldest? 33. Youngest and your youngest? 16. Wow. So rare. Most of them are off in the world. Wow. I'm home with me now. Um, but when the rare chances that they're all here in the United States, in this state, on a couch, chairs, living room, I just look and I'm like, where did you come from? Like, How is it possible that you came through me? How? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's, it boggles my mind. So, and I'm well, so grateful have, they're here. We have two. And so I just got to say, I commend you. Seven. I have one. <laughs> <laughs> I always said the first one was the hardest because I didn't know what I was doing. I had no clue. So. Well, that's amazing. You don't even look old enough to have a 33 year old. I'm just going to say that right off the bat. <laughs> I'm like blown away. So you're, in, so you're in the States? Yes. Where in the States are you? Minnesota, same St. Paul, Minneapolis. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. I always like to know because I always, I usually think all the guests we have on pretty much are from Canada. Oh, <laughs> she's not from Canada either. Oh, that's right. She's in the states as well. Actually, in our next guest, Annie's not, and she's in Florida, I believe. But you met Annie at the uh, San Diego Blue Talks event. She's the the real. Annie's in California. Yes, or California. Yes, that's correct. And then uh, Mary Elizabeth. It, it, this is the U.S. day. So I, like I have a it. <laughs> I do border Canada though. So I got that. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And I spoke of Norway. Are there a lot of Scandinavians in your area? There are. Um, sweet. Well, actually it's changed so much where I grew up. It was all immigrants from um, Germany, Austria from a long time ago, like the early 1830, 1850s settlement mm -hmm. and then Swedish and Norwegian people um, so huge Scandinavian influence and then huge, um, you know, European influence as well yeah. from Germany, Austria. So, wow. And now are you of Scandinavian descent? 
I am everything. I did do that ancestry because um, I was so curious. I always felt like I was a mutt, you know? I, one, two, three in me or something like that. Everything from Iceland through the Scandinavian countries, through all of Europe into um, what now would be West Western USSR, like all the Slavic countries. Wow. It's big, big. So. Wow, I like that's amazing. Life. I always like to know that side, you know, where are you from? You know, that's the, I'm that part of the show. Corey's like, he'll get into like the questions you're supposed to ask when you're right. on an interview. <laughs> it's, it's all well, it's, we get to know the person though, which is really cool. You don't know. I know that's what I like. I'm like, just let's sit down and have a chat. How are you? What are you doing? So Corey, I'll let you ask, you know, an official, you know, question so we can get to know how Joanne got to be where she is or, you know, how, what inspired her work. Well, I'm going to go in a different direction because you mentioned COVID and what that's sort of done to us. As I mean, as a general rule, it's impacted everybody, whether good or bad, positive, negative. And again, I know Elise doesn't like those words, but it's impacted everybody in some way. Mm -hmm. And so my question out of that, you mentioned that it's given you more time to write. Now, mm -hmm. from a business perspective, obviously, the one benefit, I guess, of being a coach and a guide is that you can do that online. You don't have to be there in person to do it. But... Has it had a, a major or massive effect on your business as far as as a business and the way you do business or because you were already, and I don't know this, but because with coaching, you can already do stuff online, did it just change it up a little bit? It, it changed it up quite a bit. Uh, I was already moving a lot of my coaching business online uh, just because I didn't want to be tied down anymore to having to be in an office, although I have a really lovely office. Um, but I also have uh, had, and I'm not doing it right now, a Reiki business. I'm a Reiki master teacher. And um, so part of my coaching, if people were local, would involve sessions where we would, you know, I would practice Reiki with them. And so that had to stop. And I really haven't gone back to that. I also was teaching that. And I do, I teach vision board workshops, which had all been in person, but I am offering one now virtually in December. Um, so it's, yeah, it's changed a lot about my business. It really has. I miss seeing people in person. Virtual has been great, but there's something about someone's essence that when you're sitting with them in conversation and you're watching their eyes light up in different ways and everything else about it, you just can't really capture virtually. So I'll miss that, but I also, I love the freedom of virtual. <laughs> Me too, girl. Me too. Get yourself an RV. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what Elise is doing. Um, I will say the Reiki master, it's it's interesting. My girlfriend is a Reiki master and a shamanistic healer. And it's, it's amazing how many uh, people that are in the Reiki world that we tend to sort of draw to ourselves or mm -hmm. it's amazing how many people I'll, I'll bring up Reiki. And years ago, before I met her, I, I had, I got Reiki before her and I got together, but, mm -hmm. um, and, and her and I grew up in the small, same small town, but we didn't really know each other that well. But I, I, had, I was actually paying for Reiki appointments before we got together. And then I found out she did it. But it's so interesting. Before I found her and I got to bring up people, I didn't know what I was talking about, like the deer and the headlights. And now 80% of the people I say Reiki to know exactly what I'm talking about. And this is only within a few years. Yeah. And I don't necessarily believe all of society's learned what Reiki is. I just think it's just end up surrounding yourself with a lot of similar people. So anyway, the Reiki part, it's, it's really cool to hear that you do that as well. Now, here's my question, this circle around to the vision board thing, because that really pulled my attention in. Because from a timing perspective, uh, I have a mastermind group. And I, Lisa's actually behind the scenes stuff, filling in for me more for the first interview, because we have a mastermind and we're doing Think and Grow Rich, and I'm the one that hosts it. So we're doing Think and Grow Rich and we're four chapters in. And of course, everybody would have done their work this week. And then I was like, oh crap, I booked their, I, booked their, I was supposed to book it an hour later. But the point of this is, is we're doing vision board next. We're on the fourth chapter in the workbook, which is creating your vision board. And so we have to, I mean, we're already working on it because we have to have it done for tomorrow technically. But now I'm intrigued by this because I know almost everybody in my mastermind group would probably love a workshop about how to do a proper vision board. So my question out of all that, is there a website? And I know I'm jumping ahead of it, but is there a website or a place where people can learn more about the workshop or register for the workshop? Yes, I'm actually, I started putting it up. I was having trouble with the date, so I'm going to finish that today. But it'll it's December 13th from the top of my head. Um, and it's going to be Central Standard Time from 1 to 3, 
three ish probably go over that i'm going to do it on zoom i um i love i love vision boarding i really do i i've done these for years and i'm going to give a shout out to christine kane here because she's the one that introduced me to vision boards a long time ago um, and I absolutely loved her intuitive process. So the whole thing is just completely, you're not supposed to have anything. You know, a lot of times when I first started this, people would come with everything already cut out and like everything they wanted. And I'm like, no, no, that's not what we're gonna do. Um, so I have my followers that come every year and, but it it is highly intuitive um, and, it's a lot of just ripping and I, I do them on canvas because I want people to hang them up and look at them every day. So what a great idea. Cause I have vision boards and actually have them right here in my office closet yeah. and I pull them out once in a while to look at them. And I have to just say yeah. like intuitively making them and then looking back and going, Oh my God, like I have RVs on there when I didn't even have an RV. I have all of these yeah. places that I've been, things that I've done that I wasn't even doing at the time, but to have it on canvas and yeah. use it as a piece of art. Yeah, so I mean, we that's brilliant. Them finish them off and they're beautiful, I have to say. I'm, I'm gonna take I'm mine like, and put it on oh, canvas. <laughs> Well, like I said, I'm I'm very it. and I'm sure other people will be in here as well. So we'll uh, we'll get you to put the website up later if you don't mind. And yeah. we'll, if you share it with me, I'll put it up later too. But I just wanted to I didn't want to let that drift by because vision boarding is such a big thing. And secondly, I believe in synchronicity. There's a reason why tomorrow I have to have my vision board done. This is a reminder, Corey. You better get on it. <laughs> but here's the thing though, yeah. to your point. Just because I have to have my vision board does, do, done, doesn't that mean that's my final vision board? But I just mean as part of our exercise, I want to be, if I'm leading it, I want to make sure I practice as well what I'm preaching. Uh, but in the book, the, the Thinking Grow Rich book, you actually can draw it if you want rather than do it. So maybe I'll just draw yeah. it, put one together. And then if I go to your uh, workshop, then I'll put my actual one together. So That'd be great. Tell yeah, me I was going to say, my vision board from last year was I didn't actually want the vision that came. I didn't want it. It was, I had this year planned of being out and traveling a lot and doing things. And it was stay, you're staying home, you're staying home. And then my word kept coming, stay, 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 stay. And then all of these things came onto my vision board that, I mean, they, they're big, but they are all in like from here, like staying and just coming from interior life. And I was just blew away, but down in the corner, I had this, this was last, did this last December, Ruth Bader Ginsburg with her boxing gloves. And um, that, and I put it down there and I, and then like, well, you know, things happen and you're just like, ah, yes, yes. I know why she was so powerful down in that corner this year, so. So, I mean, so just before we dive off the vision board thing, because I'm stuck, yeah. it's like to unpack that one step further. So one of the things when you were saying about you go with intuition. So can you tell me how that works? Because I'm trying to visualize that still where I'm so used to what you said, like going, OK, what you know, what do I want to achieve? So I'm kind of setting goals, I guess, on a board. And I will say uh, it didn't happen all within a year, but Shelly and I did vision boards. We had them in our hall, really ugly, gaudy ones, like, you know, put right on the bristle board, put on the wall and walk by it every day. And I didn't look at it regularly, but I know unconsciously I'm seeing it. And both her and I, I she achieved about 80% of it. And this is somebody who is, you know, also being a mother and all this other stuff. And these were business goals that she achieved. I achieved about 95% of mine. And again, I understand I probably set the intention by cutting it all out and all that stuff but I never thought about it the way you're talking about. So how does it actually work when you're going by intuition? Like what it, what happens that makes you go, okay, like does something pop in your head and then you go, okay, I'm gonna draw that or write that or put a picture of that or how does that work? Well, last, this is how I did it last year, which was a little different, but I decided to give them um, a sheet of words, basically, probably had a hundred words. And I said, and I gave them one minute and they were just supposed to let their eyes go over it, go over it, go over it. And whatever word was just kept popping out at them to write it down. So that was gonna be their word. And mine wasn't even on there. Mine just, my brain just kept going, stay, stay, stay. So I wrote it down I was like, dang. So then, um, so they have a word and then I do a meditation and try to, to bring them in and move them into this place of, of just deep calm 
and then just start to vision, you know, to, to basically I'll take them somewhere and they'll be in, you know, in the woods, whatever is coming up for them. It could be a seaside, something really calm. And then see, see, tell, you know, like, look for what's out in front of you that you want to bring in. And that always amazes me afterwards when people tell me what they saw and what, what they attracted into them. And then from there, I have boxes and boxes of magazines that are all laid out. And I actually, I have a relationship with a library. So they let me go at the, at, you know, in November and go through all their magazines and just take what I want because they're turning things over. And so I give people, I, I don't let them have any, anything else except magazines. They get to go give get magazines and I give them like half hour to just rip, go through the magazines and just rip. Like things that from their vision make them attracted to whatever's in the magazine. And then after they rip, then we put all the magazines away. I give them the scissors if they wanna pretty things up, I give them their canvas. And then, you know, we complete the process and then I have like a decoupage kind of stuff that they put over the top. To, it, they're beautiful. They can put, I don't care what they put on. They can write their own stuff and put it on. They could draw pictures. They could do the whole thing. They could paint. They don't have to use the magazine, but um, they're all unique. And, and it's like creating a milestone actually in one's life. Like this is a moment of inspiration visualization for me has always been a bit of a challenge. Close your eyes and visualize. I'm like, I can't see anything. You know, okay. like, I'm like, what am I supposed to see? I feel and I have inspired thoughts and action and things that I act on, you know, and I'm very in the moment. Oh, I'm inspired. I'm going to go here and do that. And so that's one of the things that guide me. I've made a commitment to my inspired thoughts and taking action. That's but perfect. But visualizing for me, like actually sitting there and visualizing me on a beach, I'm like, I could pretend I'm visualizing myself on a beach, but I really just don't see myself there. So for somebody who has is challenged, like I am, even in meditation to visualize that or trusting, maybe trusting their visual, visual, whatever's coming up in their, in their, you know, mind's eye, what would you suggest? Well, I, I would love to know that about you before we start. Okay, you know? so it's something that you would kind of inquire. Okay. Right, because those feelings that are coming up, I would have you sit in those feelings, you know, and because they're telling you a story right there. Mm -hmm. You know, wherever they came from and, and what's happening to them as you sit and what other feelings are coming in. And, you know, it because it, we all... We're going to, I'm going to use the word think, but we all think in different ways. You know, I, right. I have a daughter that it's music, like everything comes to her in music. So it, you know, it's just, it's just different. So I'd love to know those things about people. I do send out a questionnaire ahead of time. Just You do. Okay. Cause I would be like, uh, not the best visualizer, but like I get the, you know, inspired thought or if I see something I'll know, and then I'll, I can pick it once I see it because I know that there's different ways of learning. There's different ways of, Absolutely. you know, interpreting and, and, and experiencing. So I was just curious for those visually visual visionary, what would you call it? Visualizing challenged people like myself, when you're creating a vision board, sometimes my first board was daunting because I was like, what am I supposed to put on there? You know, I don't see myself in five years. I see myself right now, you know, so yeah it's a little, it was a little bit challenging for me. Well, I think, you know, you think of some of the great composers and my mind is going to music now, but some of the great composers, I would, we could talk about it as they visualized that, that um, symphony or that movement, but they're actually hearing it in their head. You know, it's so vision. I, I guess I have to learn to, reinterpret visualizing for lots of different people because I agree completely with you. Um, I have a master's in teaching and we spent so much time learning about all the different ways people learn. Mm -hmm. Children, you know, adults, and then it was heartbreaking to be do um, student teaching and find out that they wanted us to teach to a test. And I thought, but what about the tactile learners? What about, you know, we're not yes. doing any of that. So it was heartbreaking.
Exactly. You know, it's funny. It make comes a, a client comes to mind, or a couple of clients when I'm because I I do I talk a lot about thought, right, and linguistic reframing of how we're thinking and what thoughts are you focusing on and what what actions are you putting your energy towards. And so I have a couple of young clients who um, are dancers or and one and one gentleman actually, a young gentleman is a choreographer. And I said, well, when you choreograph a dance. You, you, you intentionally choose the steps that go with the music. Well, the same thing when you're, you know, choreographing your life and creating your life, what choices are you making and focus, what, what words and thoughts are you putting the most focus on? Would you put those steps that don't work in this dance to choreograph this beautiful piece? So it is about making an analogy that somebody can relate to, you know, yeah, creating this fun. analogy. Well, and, and I, I mean, when it comes to, um, the whole idea of a vision board for me too. Like I, uh, I remember when the seeker came out and you know, it was all the talk about you put it on the board or whatever you visualize it in your mind for a day. And then the motorbike will be out front your door when you walk out. <laughs> and what's interesting for me that I've, it, I've had to learn this, not the hard way, but I had to learn this during my journey is because, and you, I think one of you mentioned this a minute ago, but just because I put it on the vision board in a certain way, doesn't mean it has to come out that way. Like what you said about, it, I didn't want that, but it still came. Well, it, the, a good example of that is my girlfriend and I had felt we want to have a child. And so on my vision board, I included a picture of uh, a father holding their daughter's hand and uh, the word family and a pregnant woman and like four or five things were related to family. Well, my girlfriend and I had our son, but before we had our son, we had a miscarriage. And a lady that did a reading she said she told us so she actually it was really weird because we thought well she's wrong obviously now I'll, I'll give her a shout out her name is carmel joy baird she had a show on cnn called or not cnn uh tnt uh and then the news network the, the country news network or whatever it's called cmt i guess it is uh she had a show called mom's a medium and so we went there and she did a reading and we're like oh well she's obviously wrong because she said we were going to have uh we're gonna have a baby we're gonna get pregnant and then we're gonna have a baby at this timeline. And we're like, well, this, the timelines don't add up. We would have to be pregnant for a year and a half. Anyway, long story short, if you work the timelines, it actually, when we, she said, you're gonna get pregnant was actually the baby that we lost. But then when Sebastian was born, was almost to the month of when she said we were gonna have the baby. And wow. so the interesting part is that she said, uh, you're gonna be pregnant with a daughter. And we had a son, but she said, you're gonna have two kids. And she said, the weird part is it looks like both boys. So she said, I don't know what that means. So we feel, we have no proof of this, but we've had two readings saying that the child we lost was a daughter. So my point of this is my vision board had a man and a daughter, but who's to say that I didn't draw the vision of us getting pregnant with a daughter, but we still, and then I had family and kids and everything else. We ultimately had two sons, mm -hmm. but we were in our uh, almost mid forties mm -hmm. when we got pregnant, both of us. And we were even told by the doctors, don't get too excited. You might not even be able to have kids. And we did the vision board and she wore a fertility bracelet and all this stuff. My point is we had the kids, mm -hmm. but it was the daughter I saw in there for one of the pictures. But again, we, you know, who's to say that the child we lost wasn't a daughter. But secondly, even beyond that, we still ultimately had the family that we put on the vision board. So it doesn't have to come out the way you think, because if you put it up that way and we're planning to have a daughter, then you say, well, where's my daughter? Right. And I think well, it still came true because we still wanted a family and still wanted children. Does that make sense? It does make sense. It absolutely does. You know, it, it, you brought up um, something that was similar to something that happened in my life. I, I had a miscarriage as well. And it really, well, it brought to my attention how many women and families have miscarriage and it's never talked about, right? Because once I shared that, I had so many people come to me and say, I've had that experience too. I've had that experience too. But I, I was in my second trimester and I was in the basement at my parents' home. And I was all, all alone down there. I was gathering stuff because we were gonna go back home. And all of a sudden I had this voice like loud and clear say, his name is Gregory. And I was like, where did that come from? And I went all over the basement. There's nobody down there with me. And I thought, wow, what does that mean? It must be about the baby. So I got in the car, started driving home, and I miscarriage, have a miscarriage. Um, it's about, you know, an hour and a half drive. And by the time I got home, it was well in process and everything. And I mean, it was 
it was a, it's a loss, right? I mean, it's a it's a loss. And it, what happened after that, though, I went to see somebody like you did, Corey, and she said to me, I told her the story because I was having trouble getting beyond it. And she said to me that he wasn't for you. That baby wasn't for you. And later on, like a couple years later, I had this dream and it was, it, I found out the name Gregory meant um, forever watching over. And I thought, okay, it came through me, but was not of me. And it entered the world, you know, it's like, I'll just leave it there because um, what else can we do? I mean, it, it, it gave me peace, like this immediate peace, like, oh, okay. Now, now I now I see. Now, well, and, and to that point, what, I was nodding my head when you were saying I start. We started talking about it and realized how common it was. Yeah. That's what happened with us too. Like Shelly, really. I mean, like like you said, it's a loss. And of course, it was our first child, and we were already told we might not be able to have children. So then our heads like, is that it? Like, was that our chance? But then all of a sudden, she started talking about it, and my my mother had a miscarriage, which I didn't know. My grandmother had one or two that I didn't know, and like the whole family. Like almost, it actually seems almost more common than not common. And we didn't know that either. And and so for her, there were some, once she found out and she had the support of all these other ladies who she knew that she didn't know they had miscarriages, it changed everything for her. You know, it gave her that comfort. It gave her, wow, like I'm not the only one. Right, but, I'm not alone. But to that point, it is kind of sad, Joanne, that we don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. like people don't realize it's more common than we think. And everybody thinks I have to go through this alone because nobody's ever gone through it before. Yeah. But we learned really quickly that isn't the case. It isn't the case. And I do want to flip the script because Joanne already did on this, that what you recognized was that Gregory was a gift. Yeah. And so we, we, we look at miscarrying as this traumatic, mm -hmm. hor horrible event. That's how we place our perspective and our definition as humans. We've grown up that way. We were taught that this is a loss. However, if we look at it like Gregory coming through you and now having Gregory at our disposal, all of us, <laughs> you know, thank you so much, you know, having somebody to watch over us. And so, you know, we ask this human loss because we do lose that human connection, but we are so much grander and greater <laughs> than, yeah. than just this human body. And one of the things that I'm is a gift that I have. I'm able to connect my clients and families who have lost, they call loss, I call it transition, connect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tune into a different station and a different frequency to, to connect to that other version of, you know, who, the, yep. the the soul that 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 occupied the vehicle let's put it that way or the spirit or the energy and so you know your your daughter too Corey is also accessible you know I mean just the energy and the gift of ultimate unconditional love vibration is is a beautiful thing so I understand the hurt but I also recognize the the beauty in it as well so I wanted to share that perspective because you can have both. Absolutely. And there was a question posed and not to, and again, not to flip the script or shift gears, but um, I want to make sure I don't leave this question out, but I'm, and, and I know who posted here. So if, if there's something we're getting mixed up here, let us know. Cause I'm, there's a word I think I'm missing here with the question. Uh, but the question is what if, and this was by the way, still on the vision board, like when you said uh, intuitively creating a vision board. So the question was, what if it is beyond a problem to having, and I'm thinking no mind's eye, but I'm, I'm not sure the context of the question. So I don't know if you guys, or maybe seeing a word I'm not seeing in there. Mm -mm. Well, sometimes, huh? The no mind's eye. I'm trying to think of. There's a diff couple different ways you could think about that. You know, because some people say in my mind's eye, I can visualize that. But maybe if you have, maybe it has to do with what I least said. You know, I'm not visioning anything, and so that might be where I would work to see what, what are you feeling, you know, and describe how that feels. And um, some people, when we do these meditations, you know, have scents that come alive, like they can smell things. So, I mean, anything that happens, I would ask the, you as a participant to, you know, write it down. What else comes up when you, 
smell it, when you hear that, when you, you know, I don't know. People are amazing to me. Some people taste things, you know, um, you can describe something and they'll, the taste will come to them. And I, I can't say, I, you know, I'm just always amazed, like, wow, that's, that's so cool. <laughs> I, I think the human being is without limits. So we all experience things so differently. It's just amazing. What makes, when you said it without limits, I don't know why, but it makes me think of that movie. I don't know if you guys saw it or know what movie I'm talking about, Limitless with Bradley Cooper, where he could take a yes. pill and then his mind, he could access more of his mind until the point where it was the access too much of his mind. But it always makes me think of that. Like um, we talked, we've been, we talked earlier, I think with Sue about how like us learning more and knowing more and keeping growing. Well, I, I mean, I don't know the, the studies on it, but it feels like maybe we're accessing an extra tiny percent of our mind every time we try to grow and keep expanding and learn more and read more and listen more. It feels like maybe now we're at 5.1% or something, <laughs> but it feels like to me, you know, maybe by the end of our life, we get to like 10. And that's, that's the, the evolution most. that I was talking about that we're evolving, even though we don't necessarily physically see the evolution, right? It's still evolution. Yeah. It's that expansion of consciousness. It's that connectiveness that we're able to access where maybe we were too busy you know, plowing the fields and feeding our family of seven or more, or however many, you know, back in the day that that's where our focus was taken. And now our consciousness is expanding and our children's consciousness is a product of that consciousness in which it's coming in. I have a little different take on that because I listened to that part. And um, for example, I think some of it has to do I think there have been people that are highly evolved in every generation that have ever come through the world. You know, I really do. They were on the fringe, though. Like Jesus. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, but they, they lived at the, the fringe, the outside of society more than, you know, they weren't the celebrated ones because they were different. And I think I agree that there's more that it's being accepted now as something you know, that's beautiful and something we want and something we should celebrate. Um, but I have to say that I think as a parent, you know, like when I had, when I had different visions and I, when I was a young child, I used to have these colorful lights that would play around the room and I was wide awake and people gave me all kinds of excuses like, well, it's this, it's that. None of it made sense, so I just stopped talking about it. But I never shut it down because it was so fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and eventually it, it did go away when I started, I think, following more rules and had to grow up and things like that. Um, but later on, I was able to access that again in my life by reopening that part of myself. But I think as parents, it's such a responsibility to do what you were talking about before is that see that child for who they are and who they are becoming mm -hmm. and not shut it down because they have to fit into some box of what society wants them to be or what our parenting tells us they need to be or you know whatever modality or acculturation process we came from to try to mold them into that again because um, they're not, they're, they're themselves. They are, you know, that I am who I am and no one else. That's it. That's, that's who I am. <laughs> oh, your well, kids are so lucky to have you as a mom. <laughs> just, and like so a, lucky to have a mom like you. I mean, it's a gift to recognize that for your kids. You know, that's how the world changes is being able to see that as a parent. Thank you. They have taught me a lot more about that than I was, than I was open to in the beginning. <laughs> You know, they they have very different paths. They're all so unique. And a lot of it was faith, hope, and love. I mean, that's what it comes down to because some things it's really good. I didn't know, you know, was going <laughs> to, <laughs> to do at that time because I would have worried. At some point, though, that, you know, it's like the Gregory forever watching over. There were just sometimes I just had to say, I have to go to sleep. And I'm offering this up to whatever is out there, guardian angels, you know, whatever you believe in. But, you know, I had my own things. It's like, I'm offering this all up to you because that's too much for me. What, 
where the way they're spreading their wings, it's just a little too much for me right now. So take them, take them, so guard them, protect them. So, well, and, they, you know, and, and, yeah. oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interject there. No, go ahead. I think it's beautiful that you're able to do that. I mean, all of that, like, I just, I get goosebumps when I hear you speak of it because it's a gift for you to be able to let it be in the hands of something greater and it's a gift for them to be to that you give them to be able to spread their wings in the way that they need to on their journey you know we yeah. can't worry enough to keep the plane up didn't you ever am i the only one that ever heard that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i love that well and what i was going to mention is just that uh i think we did answer his question because he said thank you that expands a way to look for insight in terms of the behind the uh mind's ire no mind's eye, um, but I'll, I, and I know who it is, so I'll tell him he definitely should look into your workshop because I think it would be very valuable for him. But uh, one thing I want to add to that, and then I just want to ask you one more question, Joanne, and then we, of course, we have to wind down and ask you how we can learn more and all that kind of good stuff. But something you said there, because I was going to mention it, and then you uh, said it, so I feel like it's like, at least says sometimes it's a synchronicity there that I was thinking the same thing about this idea of uh, people that, maybe are a little bit more expanded in their mindset and they're looked at, like you said, in the past on the fringe. I know a lot of people I've talked to who believe that that's the case with somebody like Bruce Lee, where he was so evolved that he had to die young or like Jimi Hendrix or, you know, some of these people that died in their late twenties and thirties, but seem to just have this consciousness level that mm -hmm. seem to be way, way beyond their years. I mean, I know there's a lot of people I've talked to who believe that they were, the problem was they were getting so expanded, almost like the limitless thing, that they were too far at that age. And so they, they was like they reached their peak at a much younger age than most people do. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but that's what it made me think of when you said that. I, I don't know if anyone ever reaches a peak, though. That's the thing. I, I don't. I, I really, that's a question. Um, but I do think it gets too hard sometimes to be here. You yeah, know, and, really and, feel that way. It's just too hard. Well, and it, maybe at that level to know what they know, like meaning to be that far expanded. I had a friend of mine in uh, in high school who was this kid that could. We were allowed to miss twenty days. I don't know why they said you're allowed to miss twenty because everybody would miss. <laughs> like, they said you're allowed to miss twenty. If, if you miss twenty one, you fail. Like you, there's no way to pass. I remember something like that too. I don't remember what the days were, but. I didn't yeah. understand that. Like, it's like you're telling me, okay. I, but they, but what would happen is some kids would go, okay, I'm going to save it all until the beach days come. And then they miss like 18 days and then they get sick. And all of a sudden they're like, what do I do? Do I go to school sick? The teacher's trying to send me home. They're like, no, yeah, I'll fail if I go home. But anyway, the point is, I don't know if it's a good system, but I had a good friend of mine who he was so far advanced of us, like school-wise, that and I'm not making this up. He would skip school because it was so, like for him, it was so boring and then he would go into the library and we'd go in and catch him reading like third year biology books. While I've known kids like that. that, yeah. And so, <laughs> but the wild part is he actually failed a grade of high school because he missed too many days. It wasn't be, like, he would go and, and show up. It pissed me off in some ways. He'd say, Rick, Corey, tell me what they covered today. And I'd tell him what they covered for the upcoming test. And he'd go in and get like 90% of the test. And I'd study for three days and barely pass. Yeah. And, but he was so bored with it, he failed a grade. He ended up having to go 12 more months of something he already disliked because he was too intelligent to sit in the classroom and, and learn what he already knew inherently. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I talked to him years later and it was dreadful to him. Like, and we're still friends. And it's wild. Like, he, he works, um, he does software for a local company. And he went through a period even where uh, he was working three jobs just to get by. But yet he had this super intellect and I read his poetry and it was like poetry, like it was like he was writing like Dylan Thomas at like 16 years old. But yet again, he would go to school and be bored. And to your point, he just couldn't take it. And so he would skip and then he had nowhere to go. So he'd go to the library and just read college and university stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. Me, but that's what, so I, I know people like that. I know one person like that for sure. Well, there's a lot of them out there. I, I had a kid in my class that, um, didn't do well at school, but when we took in junior year, we took the ACTs or SATs or whatever, just like perfect score on it. And everybody's like, whoa, you know, and um, now he's a beautiful stained glass artist, but I, I think high school was just torture. But I know a lot of kids like that. I, I think that again, I don't think the way we teach 
is for everyone, obviously, but there are more kids that are coming through now that need new need to learn in different ways. And right. We're still decades behind in how we teach. Although, thanks to the global plot twist, the way that we're educating and being educated has taken a big shift and is allowing, you know, this whole virtual being home, having more experiences that way and allowing teachers to be more creative because they have to be out of necessity to hold attention to a group of, you know, 20 yeah. Zoom kids, you know, and keep them in their chair at home without getting, you know, the dogs in their lap or, you know, somebody's, you know, getting their attention elsewhere. So there is a shift happening. It's not exactly what we expected, I think, but I think it was a big yeah. shake that needed to have happen in order though. to yeah. have it globally sort of move in a different direction so quickly, let's well, say. Well, I think it, it really it really brings to into the limelight the problems that were always there. Um, yes. We were just talking you know, about that yesterday. Right, but part of it is, I think that's so hard, is there's so many kids that learn by conversation you know, having these conversations where opinions and research get bumped up against someone else, and then they learn how to come to some conclusions, that is not present in what we can do with a classroom on Zoom. It just isn't there. So I think a lot of kids are completely checked out. I mean, that's what I can see. And probably a different group of kids have checked out. There's a yeah. group of kids that checked out in the classroom because it's so test oriented, right? I mean, I'm not sure if it's the same in uh, Minnesota, but oh, no. I know in New York, it was very SOL focused. Yeah, no, because you're right. That's how I checked in probably that were checked out. And some have more probably have checked out to checked in because Right. There's probably more yeah. people that need to learn by having going, to, whether it's right or wrong, going to school and having that conversation. Truth is, I probably in high school learned as much. I hate to say it this way, but back I was like 16. But out the smoke doors, we called them, where everybody go out and smoke. And I would learn about these people that um, that were on the fringe of society. But I was like my buddy I mentioned. He always had his head shaved or pink or purple. And, and like everybody always said, oh, look at that guy. He's going to amount to nothing in life. And meanwhile, like I said, he was reading third year university books. But right. I learned more with conversations from him than I would learn in the classroom. Oh, so, I, I believe that. Yeah. But I mean, that was how I learned, right? But yeah. I, mean, I don't know the numbers, but it's like we're still not in a perfect situation yet. I hope we get there at some point. Maybe we can melt. I think the perfect situation is like live events. Meld the two. You know, have some people out that are at the live event that can make it want to go. I'm talking post COVID, and I don't know if there is a post COVID, but when we're back at live events, but then also have the virtual event part we never had before. And then the events that were always virtual, maybe they need to add a live because I think some people learn more, as you said, from the virtual side, but there's some people that need to be there at the Brendan Burchard event sitting next to somebody that they're talking to this close. I agree. You know, I had one son that um, begged me to be educated like, like is it Henry Adams? I think it's Henry Adams, where his parents just, yeah, it's the education of Henry Adams is the book, but his um, parents hired, you know, the, of course, the, in the old days, the wealthier people hired tutors, like you had your music tutor, your language tutor, you had your writing instructor, and they would spend one-on-one -on -one time with all of these different people, and he just begged me, like, mom, <laughs> <laughs> that's how I want to be educated. And I, I think it would have served him really well, but uh, that was one time where how I, old How old is that son? Now? Yeah. 30. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say if he was the 16-year-old, there's a school in Sarasota. It's called, it's a Ringling Brothers school, actually. Yeah. It's a university that's the Ringing Barnum and Bailey University yeah. or something. And the way that the university is set up is that you choose your major, you choose what you want to do your thesis on, and they go out and find the experts in that field if they don't already have them to actually teach you one-on-one -on -one that curriculum. And then you have to go and prove your thesis in front of all these experts out in the world um, that whatever your theory is or, you know, whatever it is that you're focused on, you know, you have to prove it to that panel of, yeah. of individuals. So it would have been perfect for him. It would have been. It would have been. I love conversations like this because I actually do believe that the more you look and have an open mind, the more things you find are actually happening out there.
You know? Yes. You really yes. Are. I always am like, you're always going to find what you look for. And right. I choose to look for the good in people. I look, look for great experiences and places to have fun and unique and unique opportunities. And I always find them. And I'm sure I would find the latter as well if I looked for that. So it's, yeah. what are you looking for? So on that note, there's never enough time, as I mentioned. Oh, here we go, uh, yeah. I got to bring us to a close just because I know our next guest is behind the scenes as well. Uh, but Joanne, the last, uh, somebody just put here, wonderful discussion and insights with Joanne. So thank you, Joanne. Um, but the last question, still a very important question is for people that want to learn more, we talked about your workshop and we'll make sure they get the link here. But if they want to connect with you, learn more about your work, learn, learn more about how you serve people, where would you normally send people? To my website, it's um, www.prismholistic.com. I'm also on Twitter, under Jay Wenner, um, Instagram, Joanne Wenner. Um, I think I'm on, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. I'm pretty much on all the platforms out there. You can find out I, 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 my workshops out there. Um, I'm writing a lot. I'll be in Sybil Magazine all of 2021. I'll have a monthly column in Sybil Magazine, which I think has a readership of 75,000. So uh, I think it's easy to find if you go out and look under. Did you say Sybil? S-I-B-Y-L, Sybil. Sybil, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, so there's lots of ways they can find you and it's a to be continued because we still have lots more coming from Joanne within the Blue Tox ecosystem. Uh, so Joanne, I thank you so much. You're actually in the, the next Blue Tox book that we're getting ready right now. Uh, so people will get to see lots more from you and I'll call it a to be continued. And uh, I'll probably connect you with Elise later about the Flip Your Script Friday that she does, mm -hmm. but we can explore that more later. So thank you so much, support you, honor you. I appreciate you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Nice meeting you. Fun. Great, Great to meet you, Elise. Thanks Bye -bye. so much. Bye. Bye. So I am going to, if you're okay with it, Elise, I'm gonna bring our next guest right on, um, just because I wanna make sure uh, we maximize the time. Is that okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. So quick turnover uh and you guys have met before hello hi how are you beautiful oh it's you know these times are tumultuous <laughs> so i'm keeping my head above water as best i can Doing oh my god well, at well it. now it's the head above water but the last time we actually connected there was a bunch of fires remember i was in your area yeah. and that's when that was like with last year well, it's been, um, it, yeah, it's been every year now. And um, this year has been really terrible, not right around me, but as a realtor, I mean, it's this, uh, our whole situation, it's major. We, we need to really pay attention. Um, so hopefully we will move forward into new good methods, better understanding, and generally just really need to pay attention to keeping our planet healthy and our minds healthy. I, I had one comment on, on Joanne and from my experience, I would have never ever graduated from high school if I had to count the days that I was absent. I literally, cause I ran away when I was 12 and it was right in the middle, and it's a little bit in my speech, but uh, right in the middle of my high school for like nine months. And so I ended up going to school maybe one eighth of the time. I did. Uh, what grade are you in when you're 12? Um, well, so I was actually still in the last year of junior high school. Okay. Yeah. But I, when I came, when I came back, I was in my first um, year of high school. Which is what eighth grade? See, they changed it up now. No. Yeah. So I think it was. Um, Seven, eighth, and ninth were junior high when mm -hmm. I was, you know, this was back. I graduated okay. high school in 69. Okay. So, yeah. But that, um, the same structure that I had too. Grade one to six was um, elementary. elementary school, yeah. yeah. And then seven to nine was junior high. And then senior high or high school was 10 to 12. So it sounds like yeah. the same structure. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I was. I think they changed it now, but yeah. Yeah. But so I, I, I'm, I'm, I only have a high school degree. I've been in senior management for over 40 years and very accomplished and very successful. So I'm all about changing up education. <laughs> or the concept of education. Well, right? I don't know about, it's, it's what we teach, how we teach. Yeah, I'm, but education's education. 
I well, I mean, the concept of that you have to do this in order to get here, and you're living yeah. proof that, no, you didn't yeah. have to take that route of education to become successful. And to Corey's point, he had this friend who was absolutely brilliant, but had to work three jobs to keep food on the table. So it's not yeah. the intelligence, the brilliance, or the education. It's who you are and the ingredients that make your signature dish, really. And I think it's about priorities. I mean, we in, in traditional education, it's getting a little bit better, but it's still so focused on subjects. It's not focused on developing our mind, making sure that we're problem solvers. I mean, I, I, as when I became, you know, hiring people and I, they, they had college degrees from the best universities and everything. I'm sitting there with my little high school degree and they're going, well, I can't do this. And I go, you're talking to your boss. <laughs> you better step up or you're not gonna get anywhere in life despite all your education. So we need to really work on our minds and um, do a lot of things. I'm gonna be speaking about this if I get a chance. <laughs> yeah, I no. yeah, and uh, so you mean, you mean speaking about it now you mean, or like you mean, no, no, it is. Uh, some of it's in my speech, but it oh. just was ringing so many bells when Joanne was speaking. So I just really wanted to mention it. Um, she was saying the right things also. So awesome. Well, and uh, what was I going to tell you about? Oh, the uh, I. It's funny because we were talking yesterday about the book Outwitting the Devil. I don't know if you're familiar with that book or not. Oh, oh trust me, I'm very familiar. I'm in the Greg Reed, Sharon Lecter sphere of influence gotcha so you i mean that yeah. book, uh, and uh, at least you said you listened to it as well i mean that book talked to exactly what we're talking about if somebody mm -hmm. wants to know what you're talking about with what the education system looks like and could look like i mean that book is a good place to go even yeah. sounds cool to say that because a book written in 38 shouldn't be that far ahead of its time but it was and it's funny to talk about synchronicity you wouldn't have seen this yesterday probably any but you mentioned i'm in the sharon Lecter, greg reed uh sphere of influence and both of them co-wrote this book uh, and, and, and that book i think it's holding up one of my tvs but it's right here also <laughs> <laughs> love it so I, I forgot to give you a heads up annie's going to do a bit of a presentation for us i and, love it and then we're going to then we're going to come back and do a bit of a q a is that still work for you okay annie Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. That works. Okay. What we're going to do. Look at you, girl. I'm so excited. I can't wait to hear it. Awesome. So what we're going to do, though, uh, if that works okay for you, Annie, is we're going to take ourselves both off the screen so you get a little bigger on the screen. And what I'll do is uh -oh. I'll... <laughs> no, it's all good. And I'll come back on uh, and I'll bring Elise back on just to give you a kind of a heads up as far as timing. Does that work okay? Okay. Um, okay. I think... I, I might have gone through it a little fast, but I think about 20 minutes is my. That'll work perfect. We have, a, we have about 35 Just minutes. Just put your finger on your chin when you're ready for us to come back on. Yeah, if you want to come on before we come on. Oh, you'll, you'll, you'll know. <laughs> I'll, I'll hear you winding down. But I only say that because we have about 32 to 35 minutes total. So if you're okay. 20, we'll give us some time for some questions. So that perfect. works. And to make sure we maximize that, I'm going to send us both backstage and let you take the stage. Thank you guys, see you later. Hi everybody. I wish this was really live because I have a feeling that all of us have been going through so much. 2020 has not been easy and this could be more of a conversation. And I'm sure that many of you are struggling with 2020 and hoping for a better 2021. And a lot has been happening in just the past couple weeks, but none of us ever expected to have to live through a pandemic, especially a pandemic that has killed so many of our families and it's getting worse. And, you know, we're losing people. It's completely off the charts. We have to do better. And with that, I've never worried about how fragile this democracy is before now. But in fact, Ben Franklin, when he was signing the Constitution, the first version of it, he walked out of the building and somebody asked him, so do we have a republic? And he said, yes, but can you keep it? And I know that this is a multinational audience, but this is in all of our interests. 
So we really need to pull together because this country, but all countries, but this country especially is of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it's our democracy to really save and to hold on to. And we need to learn how to have meaning, meaningful conversations where all voices are heard. Sorry about my computer. Um, so we've just become so completely divided. I mean, today is actually the two week anniversary of the presidential elections here in the USA. And while the president elect has over 5.5 million votes over the incumbent, um, we are pretty equally divided. And from the president's lectern, this current president's lectern, there has been very little that is truth and fact based. And I don't think we wanna bring up our children to not believe in truth and facts. So this is a very dangerous because we should not be making decisions based on false information. Further, several sections of mainstream media also don't stick to the facts. We need to get back to holding truth and facts as the basis of all things. And we need to re-embrace our integrity and stop being a poor example to our population. Many who do not fact check and the world. And I just want to talk about how we can heal and how we can save our democracy. Because honestly, there's been things at work that are really destroying our rule of law. And the separation of Congress and our whole government, you know, we have the executive branch, which is the presidency and the Department of Justice. We have the Supreme Court and we have Congress, and we have all these things set up, and they've worked beautifully for over 200 years. But at the moment, they're very fragile, and the function is being undermined. So with that preamble, which has been a growing passion of mine um, the past few years, let me tell you a little bit about myself. And for starters, I have had to live with fear and uncertainty off and on for most of my life. My parents had separated when I was young. They were loud and sometimes violent. And that was hard to see as a little child. Later, I had a wonderful stepfather who implanted a lot of value, good values and good traditions into me. And it didn't hurt that he was a Swiss ski instructor who had us living in Yosemite for several years. But my mother, on the other hand, while beautiful and loved by many, was very abusive and mentally ill. I even ran away across the country when I was 12 to get away from her. And it was quite the adventure in history-making times in the 60s. And often there is both really bad juxtaposed with the really good. And my, while my early childhood was troubled, I also grew up in nature and was exposed to just amazing things. And I had wonderful surrogate mothers who helped me manage when my mother would abandon me to take care of my siblings when I was way too young. So after my jaunt across the country, which is a whole nother book, by the way, I returned to try to live with my real father. And this was broken up with periods that I lived with surrogate families. And I actually love them all, by the way, and thank them. And I actually graduated from high school with my class. But I was angry. I was depressed. And I had a huge chip on my shoulder thinking the world owed me something. I did want to become successful and productive. And I was strong and I knew I had a great brain. And I, But I finally realized that I wasn't getting a positive reaction from those who could really help me as I started, you know, in my adult life. So I re finally realized I had to change. And I didn't know how. 
and I tried many things and actually a lot of them are still within me. But I finally found constructive living, which, su which um, suggested learning to set our feelings aside and do what needs to be done. And this has become a part of me and starting with only a few minutes of forcing myself out of bed to get up and do something positive. And for me back then, that was washing the dishes. And over time, the productive time grew and the negative feelings faded. It took work, trust me, but we can change our whole lives. And after that, or even all of it from running away to becoming adults and finally going to work. Um, I chose adventure over college for some years. I traveled the world and I ended up living on a 57 foot catamaran, beautiful boat. And I became a celestial navigator before there was G GPS and logged 44,000 sea miles throughout the Pacific, landing in many, many beautiful spots, a lot of culture. And it was wonderful and I wouldn't trade the memories for anything. And so learning, you know, I had been working on learning to control my feelings, which came in handy when I had to control my overwhelming fear during storms at sea, where I really had to go to sleep despite the huge waves pounding on the boat. But I had to sleep because I was a key crew member that the boat needed, and so I did. And after some years, I jumped ship in Tahiti to go home to the USA for a visit. And I meant to go back, but I didn't. And that beautiful boat that was my home and still had a great deal of my life and all my family heirlooms on her was lost at sea with all souls on board, including my life partner. And it was a period where I felt my own life was over. I was so grief stricken and the depression again overwhelmed me. And it took a while, but I finally realized how young I was and how my whole life was in front of me. And, and I chose to live the best life I could. So I got up and moved forward. Now, over 40 years later, I have done many things. I spent most of my corporate life in senior management, despite my high school degree being my only degree. But here we are. We're living in a time of fear and uncertainty. And as I've said, I've lived through both in different circumstances. And so I want you all to know that we will all get through this. And it is very important that instead of focusing on the uncertainty and fear, we need to focus on the future with bold goals and dreams and keep moving forward. Take this time to really explore the opportunities that will allow us to pivot and reach up to meet the challenges of our changing future. Starting out in life, we all develop desires and beliefs, and they stack up in our subconscious. And some are innate, some are positive, and some will be negative. And we are influenced by the environments around us. And I know we were talking about education, but a parent, a teacher, and others can lift you up or tear you down with just a few words. And the effects of each will likely grow lasting roots in our subconscious. And we often lose awareness of where, you know, these beliefs come from. Frequently, we do not even know we have them. Unconsciously, our subconscious beliefs will lead us in life for better or worse. So we all know these as limiting beliefs and we need to be aware and we need to know while difficult and they are not easily dislodged, but it is possible with work. 
I know. <laughs> in my lifetime, while knowledge and information has become more and more accessible and abundant, I find we focus too narrowly on subjects and too little on developing our humanity and personal growth. And while we learn to solve equations, we don't necessarily learn how to be problem solvers. Life skills such as fiscal responsibility and how to hone our own innate abilities, which are different for each of us, are not really emphasized. And we need to focus on our special purposes in life. And the sooner we start, the better off we will be as we have to really live up to them. And a purpose that will lead to our individual happiness while serving others and contributing to the world because we all have something to offer. And many of us do not believe this or think about this enough. So I ask you to look within. Having lost both my mother and my brother to mental illness, I also advocate more attention needs to be given to managing our minds. And while there are severe mental cases that require intervention, I question some of the ways we currently treat disorders. And I have 60 plus years of observing from the sidelines in a very real environment, the progression of treatment and access to real treatment, such as one-on-one -on -one and group counseling is out of reach for most. And we do not practice training our minds from an early age. So when the darkness tries to settle in, we do not have the tools needed to reject the darkness and move back into the light. And I have had to watch the side effects of medications and other psychiatric treatments wreak havoc on souls and body. And I hope for change. And I hear this from a lot of people who are suffering and trying to survive their issues. And today, we all know there's an unacceptable, num unacceptable number of overdose deaths, suicides, and other damaging results due to our not being able to find peace in our own minds. The number of homeless continues to grow and has become an absolute crisis for our whole society. We need to seek new solutions and take more responsibility for our troubled one, especially our veterans. And I still have nightmares about how, when combined with all of what I have spoken about, with climate change, this world will become increasingly unwelcoming to human health, prosperity, and even life itself. I don't know if any of you have checked out the temperature ranges in some parts of the world, but it's coming everywhere. If we do not urgently make changes, we will regret it. But I'm an expert at starting over. I've had to start over many times. And during those times, I needed to learn how to heal from anger, grief, and other periods of great upset. And I finally, as I mentioned before, found some practices which have allowed me to take charge of my feelings and create a positive, productive, and meaningful life. And you can build these muscles too. You never know when you will need them. So looking back on what I've learned, I truly believe that we can all learn these things. And I now am just dedicated to helping other individuals who maybe experience hard times of their own. Thanks to the practices I now implement in my life, I no longer fall into deep depression and I find that I can manage the dark moments with efficiency. I now live my life optimistic about each new day and internally grateful, truly grateful for the life that these practices have afforded me the opportunity to live. 
And again, my passion now is to be supporting others in learning how to transcend hard times and to set their goals on the life they want to live. I wish to help them find their true purpose and passion. Also how they can move out of depression, loss and other ills, change their path and rebuild and start over if they need to. We need to strive to be the best we can be. And these are troubling times and it's more difficult, but we must be prepared for sudden and radical change. Once you understand the principles, it will take reflection, practice and action. In other words, it takes work. But these are processes that you can learn and with practice, they will help train yourself to move out of the darkness that you may feel from time to time. And if you can manage to persevere while your brain slowly adapts to new beliefs, you can fundamentally change the way you feel about everything and live a, a productive and happy life, regardless of what state you are starting from. And I believe it is possible to take charge of our feelings, to be responsible for our actions and to move ourselves toward the life that realizes our full potential and to create an action plan that will move us forward to the life we want to live. We should all look within frequently and continue to grow throughout our lives. That means to set lofty goals and strive to realize them. Visualize who you want to be and where you want to be in your future. Adjust as needed and check in with your goals often. They're subject to change. We all deserve to live our new day, no matter how bad today is. And I'm going to pause here. Um, I'm going to go over just a few principles that I live by if I still have time. Um, so again, to repeat myself, but repetition is necessary, especially if you want to affect your subconscious. We need to learn how to set our darker feelings aside. They will always be there to visit. This takes practice and commitment. While feelings of grief, trauma, and other dark feelings are real, we need to spend as little time as possible with them so that we can continue to move forward. And it's important to note that our thoughts and feelings are really transient in our mind, so we can change them. Willpower cannot change feelings, but behaviors can change feelings. Work to be as productive as possible and do what needs to be done. Productivity feeds the soul, you know, and we should be congratulating ourselves for every minor little thing that we're able to accomplish. And focus on what you want and also focus on what you need to change in your life. Too many of us go on remote control. Create a new roadmap for yourself if there's things missing you want to change. Really know what you want. Spend time on visualizing what you want in your future. And what you focus on is what you can attain. And Napoleon Hill said, whatever the man the mind of man can conceive and believe it can achieve. And so I want to repeat, learn to change your state. And this can be manifested in many ways, incantations, affirmations, meditation, dancing, jumping jacks, walking on the beach, hugging a tree, laughing, find what works for you, mix them up, but just know that you cannot just dwell in your hard feelings. Work to reach your subconscious with new positive core beliefs. And again, all of the above will help do that. And again, celebrate you in every way you can. 
celebrate each tiny success and this will help you to influence your subconscious do all these things repeatedly and often because it does take time especially if you have a lot of you know limiting beliefs it really we need to learn how to love ourselves so until you do just keep working on it strive to be happy because it's just a state of mind and live in your own truth be your uh, authentic self and always know that you can start over thank you so much for listening it's great to be able to share this with you wow girl, wow, girl. mic drop <laughs> <laughs> That was amazing. And I and I met you in the I think I met you in the beginning and mm -hmm. in San Diego live, right? We got an right, opportunity right. to be live and so I had like a seed planted but this was like really impactful. Like, well, it's been a journey. <laughs> but and also at that time I have to admit in San Diego I, I you know, I commanded factories and factory owners and worked all over the world. But I never was comfortable with speaking in front of people. So I've been a little bit working on it. <laughs> well, I can tell, like, wow. And it's Thank been you. about a year, right? It was yeah, in November it, of last year. It might have been like within the day. <laughs> wow. Wouldn't that yeah. be something? We're going to have to ask Corey yeah. because it was like yeah. November around it, now. I lose track of time, I must admit. And so much has been going on. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Wow. So, so thank you. yeah, no, thank you for sharing. And all of those tips and things that we can apply in our life on a daily basis, on a minute to minute basis. And, you know, a couple of things that you said that struck a chord with me, um, because it's a philosophy that I live by and share, you know, mm -hmm. with clients as well, is that, you know, our, our beliefs are chronic thoughts that grow roots. So when you can shift your your way of thinking, right, and be repetitive, right, and right. can you know repeat, repeat, repeat those seeds, drill, drill, those new, new seeds. I call them thought weeds that right. have probably rooted become be belief weeds, and then right. we have these mind seeds, these new ways of thinking. And if you can plant that seed over and over again, it can also take root. So I love Absolutely. how you. And it does take what I mean, listen, you plant a seed, you have to water it and give it the sunlight and fertilize and you don't know what's going on below. But those roots are growing before you even see the first sign of anything coming through. And we're actually at the same time trying to put a little weed killer down there as well, because like, you know, like I say, we, you know, we get to be adults before we even realize what's going on in our minds. So Absolutely. that's why. I really wish that we would spend more time, you know, it, we can really learn these things at an early age. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I, I see would, EFT, I'm not, and I'm going to toot my EFT horn, emotional freedom yeah. technique is a great weed killer. It gets to that yeah. subconscious paradigm and really can reframe and shift and even, you know, dislodge or delete those old files that no yeah. longer benefit who we are in this upgraded version of ourselves. So EFT is, you know, find a practitioner, learn more about it online, emotional freedom technique, because it is a great thought I, I, weed, I've been exposed thought weed to killer. <laughs> um, I know Corey wants to say something, but I just wanted to mention, I was able to go to Kenya last year also and I was able to be with the Unstoppable Foundation and also the WE Foundation who have been there teaching Bob Proctor's curriculum for the past 11 years. And I experienced the first college um, level graduation. And I mean, these kids are built from the bottom up and those girls can get on any global stage and outspeak anybody. Some of them are going to be presidents, and it's off the chart. So this is possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you. So ahead, I'll, I'll just add in, uh, and I'll answer the question that Elise asked, just so it's not left unanswered. Um, you guys shared the bill in October sixth uh, and seventh. Oh, okay. So uh, okay. Over a year. And um, I will say that 
I know I I'm a, as you know I'm a memory guy anyway. But even if I didn't know those dates, I'd know it was October because our son got deathly sick at the end of that trip. I don't know if you remember oh, the no. dates. We had to yeah. bring, he was fully dehydrated. We had to bring him back and put him on IV. This is our three and a half. I had no idea. Yeah, he got sick while we were in San Diego. We were planning to drive to LA, and it meant we didn't tra travel to LA. We had to change all our tickets. I remember the price too. It was pretty pricey, like five thousand dollars to change by two days because mm. we couldn't fly home with them. So we flew home, and we don't know still to this point what he caught because it was like middle, you know, San Diego. It's gorgeous. It's warm. We went to Old Town, San Diego, and on the way home, he got sick, and then it was on. And for seventy hours, Tim and Shelley uh, didn't sleep. They didn't eat. And anyway, we got home, but yeah, it was pretty rough. So I, I know that was October, so I, I'll never forget that timeline. No, I guess oh, you won't. Right. But I do remember hearing that you, you know, bailed and you got sick and everything. I was, yeah, yeah it was pretty, pretty dicey. Um, but now going back to what you said, Annie, and we are, we're down kind of to the wire, but I want to ask you, uh, I know a big part of your focus, and you talked about this a bit, but a big part of your focus is around mental health. And if you, and I know this is big, but I know you talked about it in your blue talk, if you <laughs> sort of a call to arms, if you could say, this is, this is where we need to start making changes, where would you say we need to start? Well, I, as, I, as I spoke, I mean, first is we need to realize that we need to start at the beginning as we're growing. So we, that's education, that's how we treat people. Um, but also we've gone to medication and really honestly, because I'm actually out there, you know, speaking to a lot of people who are just, they go in for like one visit, they're handed a prescription and then they go back and what's evaluated are the side effects. And these people are telling me, you know, I'm not myself. I, you know, I'm managing the demons, but I'm not myself. And I experienced that with my own mother. She was an artist and everything. So we need to change the whole dynamic. I'm not saying medications aren't good. They're useful. They're one thing in the toolbox, but we cannot just blanket everybody with medications. It's not working. I don't know if you know this, Annie, and at least you might not notice this or might not know this as well. I can't remember you guys sh shared the bill. Being bad if it was the day, but you might not remember this at least. Uh, and Annie, I don't know if you ever knew this, but while you were speaking at the Blue Talks event, we actually had a, um, a situation at the front door with somebody. Oh, you might remember this at least because you and Shelly went down the road with the guy and talked to him, remember? Yeah. Uh, but we actually, uh, I would guess based on what we've seen, that it was somebody that struggles with mental health. And he was at the door making a racket while you were speaking. And I thought, this is a synchronicity. You know, you're talking yeah. about mental health issues. And there's a gentleman who's challenged right at the front door. And ultimately, Shelly bargained with him to get him to, to move from the front door just so we could, you know, open up the front door because the place, the people that own the place, they just want to go kick him out. And she's like, well, yeah. let me talk to him. And because right. she suffered with mental health and addiction, she talked to him and negotiated with him. But I just thought it was so, it was such a synchronicity to remind us what exists. Rather I than was probably too focused in my head when I was speaking, but I I may have run into him that same time because I went shopping after that event and there was a guy holding a sign, you know, saying, fully out saying that he was schizophrenic. And I had to go turn around and stuff to go, you know, talk to him. And it, maybe it was too far, but I'm just saying, talk about synchronicity of all. And, you know, people are really crying out for help. And I couldn't really help him other than to just to say, you know, really, I understand you. And, you know, I hope that you, because what I, what I notice is that sometimes it fires off in the person's head that, hey, I'm going to take charge of this. And for him to hold a sign, you know how unusual that is. I'm a schizophrenic. Um, so denial is one of the things that really holds us all back. Well, and I, I, one thing I think it's important to acknowledge there is you said, I couldn't do much. So I just said, hey, I see you, even though uh -huh. you use words. I really feel in a lot of cases that is a lot. That's yeah, it is a lot. That's yeah. like huge. We were yeah. talking about parenting. If you just looked at your right. child and said, I see you. Right. Wow, that's <laughs> like, okay, game on. Well, think I about it. I mean, we again, we have a three-year-old, so I'm experiencing all these things now. But I, I, I said, so our son, he gets pretty hyper sometimes, 
And I think it's just that he wants that attention. And he's saying, give yeah. me the attention. And I always think of this episode of The Simpsons. I don't know why, but <laughs> there was an episode of The Simpsons where Bart was over doing cartwheels and all this stuff. And nobody was looking at him. And so he was like doing everything he could to get noticed. And finally, one of the kids said, hey, look, guys, it's Bart. He's doing stuff. And then they all look at Bart and then he's fine again. And I feel like that side of things, like my son, he just sometimes he just wants attention. So he'll act up because he figures that's going to get me the attention. And so to your point, Elise, if we just say, I see you, and then we have to say it in different ways because he's three. But right. if we acknowledge that he's there and say, hey, buddy, what, you know, you want to play? You want to play Lego? What do you want to do? All right. of a sudden, changes. His whole energy changes. I think to add to that, um, I know with me that inclusion was a huge thing. So, you know, even we think, well, this is a grown up thing and we're talking and, and hey, you know, leave us alone. We're talking. But sometimes bringing them into the conversation, it it creates a whole new dynamic. And, you know, kids really want to be adults. Often they have. The, better ideas and, you know, a lot of things. So, you know, maybe just think about that every once in a while because, you know, it's, yeah, he wants a lot of attention um, and rightfully so. I mean, kids need attention. But, and they, and you know, you're right. They are brilliant, Nanny. Yeah. Yeah. But bringing them into the conversation may make it actually easier. On, just experiment. Let well, me know. Not, like if he go, if he gets in that thing, um, you know, Shelly and I will handle it different ways depending on the day, but he gets in that thing of mommy, 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 mommy. Yeah. And and he's not going to stop until she acknowledges right. <laughs> so, you know, She might be trying to get something out, but I'm like, you know what? You might as well acknowledge him because what you're trying to get yeah. out will be longer. Nurse yeah. is not going to hear you. And it's funny. All you have to say, what is it, dear? And he tells you two seconds and then he's fine. But yeah. Speaking oh. of the Simpsons, that was my son. When my son called me on the cell phone, remember, it was like, ma, 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 what? That was tone. <laughs> so when my son would call me, it was Marge, I guess. Was it from The Simpsons? It was that really yeah. that we had. And Bart was like, Ma, Ma, Ma. And she's like, What? <laughs> and that's true. really what it is. It was a great representation, but it's not like the what. It's more like, don't let it get there. Like, yeah. you know, like you can acknowledge that they're there even if you're in the middle of a conversation and just right. put your hand on their shoulder. Like, you don't even have to say anything. It's just that acknowledging that they're there, giving them that space, finishing what you're doing so it doesn't get to the point where they're having like a moment, you know, and it's <laughs> practice, just like you talked about, Annie, yeah. it's a practice. Uh, I mean, practice, I think, is really one of the huge things. We, you know, all of us, I'm sure, and probably most everybody listening, have all read really great books like Outwitting the Devil and everything, Think and Grow Rich. But you realize that some people read Think and Grow Rich over several times a year. Repetition is key. I know when I wrote my book, which is Live for a New Day, um, which if somebody contacts me, I will actually give you a copy. It has a lot of this in it. But um, it, it's, you know, the editors went and they took my story and they put everything together into silos and i go this doesn't work it i purposely put it here and there because it's about repetition you don't just get something the first time you hear it so mm -hmm. so true and to that point you mentioned about people uh reading thinking grow rich a couple times a year and he would mm -hmm. know because you mentioned his name at least i don't know if you i've shared this with you but bob proctor carries uh -huh. around or rich everywhere he goes and for 57 years He's read from the book every day. Yeah. Wow. Years. And so hey, I get have whole, you seen that book? Because he cares. Yeah. I get to hold the book because we were filming a docu series. Uh -huh. He was involved in it. And then I said, Did you ever think about, like I said, I know you have the book, the, the beat right. up the book. Did you ever think about buying a new one? He goes, Are you kidding me? The energy's yeah. all in that book. And then right. he yelled at some guy like Jason that was uh, working on site. Jason, could you grab me the copy of Thinking Grow Rich? And he brought <laughs> it out and he opened it up. It's a uh, elastic band holding it together. The papers yeah. are all falling out. The pages are yeah. yellowed. He's got marks mm -hmm. all in them. It's insane. But he said, uh, and he said this. It doesn't all, even close. Yeah. No, it doesn't. And he said on, this was on air. So I wouldn't say it if right. he didn't. But he said, my assistant re told me one day when I got back, she goes, I wish you wouldn't go back so soon. I was going to rebound your copy of Think and Grow Rich. And he said, I almost lost my mind. What? You're going to rebound it? Like the energy is in that book. And so, yeah, he reads from it every day. And he said every day, 57 years later, he still gets something new. Yeah. And by the way, what I love about Bob Proctor, 
he also only has a high school degree. You're in good company. Yeah. And you know what? I mean, at the end of the day, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not only like when you go back to Think and Grow Rich since we're talking about that, and, and I will start winding us down soon because I know our next guest is going to be coming on any second. But um, Think and Grow Rich, if you go back to that book, look at the people in that book that barely had a grade three education. Right. You know, who was it? Was it Thomas? Yeah, Thomas Edison only Thomas had two months of education his whole life. I don't know if you know that at least. Thomas Edison, the guy who invented the light bulb, only had three months of formal education his whole life. And But here's the common trait, going back to your point, Annie, about books. The common trait, if you look at all the leaders of yesterday, what they do have in common, the ones that rose to the top, they all have personal libraries in their home. Yes. You think that's a question? <laughs> they all have fed their mind long after the formal schooling was done. I'm not saying that today that's the case, but back then when books and were the option. I think it's definitely the case. As we go virtual and every, and I have actually a huge bookcase, but it's not on camera. I, I want to try and set it up. I lived for 17 years without a bookcase. So now I'm overgrown with books. I can see but, some of your books, Annie, in the corner. Okay, yeah, it's there. in the corner, yeah. <laughs> um, but people on all of the virtual, you know, it's amazing. I'm looking at the libraries. I'm trying to check out their titles and it's, it's pretty interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. So Annie, having said all that, I mean, we covered a lot of ground. I'll call it a to be continued because I know we barely scratched the surface, especially a big area like mental health. I know there's so much yeah. more we can cover and you and I can talk uh, off air about me bringing you back onto my podcast because I think it's a long time since we did that. And then also, at least I'm sure you'd be open to having her on a Fruitly Script Friday as well. So let's keep getting this powerful message out. But in the interim, Annie, uh, most important question is, and you mentioned your book, um, but where can people connect with you to learn more? Um, so I'm I'm pretty accessible. I'm on LinkedIn, Annie Evans Sales, S-A-I-L-S. -S. I'm on Twitter, but not so much. I have decent Facebook, you know, and I mean, I share my cell phone number, my email, all of it is in the bio. I don't know when the book's coming out, but, um, you know, so my book is at www.livefornewday, the title of the book.com. And, I, you know, I also have set your sales again, S-A-I-L-S.com, which I'm still building out. I'm totally accessible. So um, I'll even just say if it's okay, my cell phone and email right now. And yeah, again, yeah. anybody that reaches out to me can um, get a copy of my book. Um, so my cell phone is 310-621-0456. And the email that I use is Annie, A-N-N-I-E at A Evans, R-E for realestate.com. Oh, and by the way, I've gotten into um, financial literacy, and so now I'm a, a life agent, but it's mostly about giving people education on how to build their wealth and create better lives for themselves. Stuff that I wish that I had learned 60 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And can they find out about that on your website going forward? Like, is that going to be? Um, it's still not that present on my website, but it, I do have um, a domain and it's going to be built out and it will all be linked together. But for sure, anybody can ask me anything and I will do my best to get back to them. I'm really trying to do a lot of this one on one because I feel like that's what people need right now. Well, and so. And I told you, Annie, and at least, I don't know if, uh, if you heard me share this before, but Annie's in good company. There's only been about five people, and it's not to say it's good or bad that, to do it, but only been about five people in my interviews. Now, we're talking over 6,000, over 6,000, wow. really, who've given out their phone number. Uh -huh. and, uh, Annie's one of them. And besides Annie, off the top of my head, Michael Gerber, who wrote the email, Tom Ziegler, Zig Ziegler's son. Um, uh, we had him on, uh, I know. I don't know if you were on that one. I uh, know you weren't probably. Jeff Hoffman, uh, who is a billionaire who created Priceline.com. I love Jeff. I, you, you're naming a couple of my favorites. So I'm and in good company. 100%. And the last one off the top of my head is, uh, and he passed away, but the late Bill Bartman, who was mm -hmm. the 25th richest man in North America at one point. And so you're in good company, Annie, is all I'm going to say. Yeah. Well, and if I, I respond to a, a post, I'll give out my, I'm just like, just text to me. It's easier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, all my years of corporate, I got, you know, I was usually that um, 
what do you call it, you know, the shelter of the CEO, CEO or, or whoever, I, I can get off the phone really quick if I need to. Absolutely. That's so. too funny. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that you're that person that puts it out there. So Yeah, because really, I'm all about, you know, if somebody wants to reach out, I will really try and be there for that person. It's amazing. So Annie, this has always been a pleasure and is an absolute pleasure. Always. Thank, thank you, Corey, for doing all this. It's been great. I wish I had been more involved because all of what you guys are doing is really great. I've just been so busy on the other side. So it's all good. To You're be here. Great to see you again. Yeah, you too. You yeah, too. Hundred percent. Thank friend. you. Thanks thank so you much. So, much. We'll talk bye soon. Bye. so at least I'm going to do another quick turnover. I'm uh, going to bring our next guest right on. Flip it. Just so we maximize our time. Flip uh, it, girl. Oh, this flip is the, it. I love those glasses. I was going to be oh, like, I was going to message you, where do I get a pair? Because I like, that's the one thing, like glasses online, like yours are s perfect because you could see your eyes. I'm always like, right. is the shadow here? Like, I'm I so, know like, that. Well, I <laughs> did get non glare, um, what do you call it? Coding. Ooh, I need to talk. We need so, to chat. <laughs> yeah, because I used to have blue blockers and every every my eyes sort of had this purple haze over them, which was great, but you couldn't see my eyes. So I I got rid of that and I got um yeah, a non-glare kind of code. And I love of, them. I'm precisely because like, of video. Them. Yeah, I, they're like a they're like a sort of exploded cat eye. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you know? I, they're good. I'm like, I'm just gonna put goggles on because then at least I can, you know, <laughs> see, but that's not very sexy. So I do love your no. glasses. Nice well, to meet you. you <laughs> nice to meet you too. I love your background. That brick wall is thank amazing. Thank you. It, and you know, it's just like <laughs> Oh, if I oh. move too quickly, it's like, actually, it's Corey inspired, because remember, you had that backdrop in yeah, one of our interviews or something. And I was like, because I RV a lot. So I never know where I'm going to be. And so this has just been my like signature. I've I seen. Oh, thank you. I've seen I have to be very um, intentional about what I wear. So I don't clash. Totally. But I mean, if that's the only issue, I'm good. Yeah, you're good. And that dark red is beautiful. That's one of my favorite reds. Oh, thank you. Thank that, you. For Corey, yeah. Oh, well, for him. That, yeah, it's yeah, kind of like dark, terracotta, that, right? It's like, right. It's kind of vermilion, really. I love well, it. Well, I have I have multiple walls that at least knows this because of us doing multiple set. I have like four walls set up where I can do interviews and every day be different. Now, today and yesterday, I used this same wall, but I could theoretically do a five-day event and every day have a different wall backdrop. Oh, that's brilliant. And, and I, that's partly... I mean, we, I selected them, but Shelly, it was my girlfriend's idea to get this office. We have an office here in the waterfront. And at first I was like resistant because I'm like, I work from home. Why do I need an office? But now I'm thankful she did it. And the irony, yeah. she did it, she's more productive at an office. Uh, and then we decided to have another baby. And so she hasn't been in the office and I've been using all the, all the oh office that I was even going to get. So, but yeah, so that's where Elise is talking about is that I'm looking over both these walls have sort of a weird brick kind of cool concept. Cool. Yeah. Oh, so you're giving me good inspired. ideas. <laughs> yeah, Amazon, baby, Amazon. Yeah, right on. So uh, now I'm going to see if I pronounce your name 100% correct. Marie Elizabeth Mali? Or Mo? It's actually Molly. Molly, okay. Mm -hmm. I had right the second try. Uh, yeah, yeah, no worries. So, uh, well, and that's the thing. I mean, there's a lot of people I've been talking to for a long time, I've known for a long time, but I've never ever pronounced their name once, their last name especially. And exactly. So, it, it, you know, so this is my chance to learn them. So this is pretty cool. So far, I'm striking pretty good. I think at least I've pretty much nailed the names and yours. I had it on my second try before you said it. So I was like, I sort of knew it was one of the two. Um, so I guess where I wanted to start, though, we usually start here. Uh, and I say start because we jumped right into a conversation. Uh, but I'd like to know a little bit more about your backstory or background uh, for the viewers so they get to know you a little bit more as well. So can you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, I'm a relationship alchemist. And what that means is I help people take all the elements of their life and relationship, even the stuff that they think is broken and that they don't like and that they feel is not working. And I help them craft it into a whole that really works, that that's gold. Um, and one of the main ways that I do that is really by encouraging people to cultivate presence, being more present and being more able to be with whatever is happening internally, you know, not letting it knock them out, but not stuffing it or ignoring it either, but learning how to be present with it all so they can show up more resourceful and clear and powerful, no matter what's going on. 
Um, and obviously that's an ongoing practice. But, uh, and how did I come to this? Well, I've been someone who's always loved my work. Uh, I, I've been in patient care for, thir uh, for 30 years, basically. I was first a massage therapist in the early 90s. Then I uh, got a master's in Chinese medicine and became an acupuncturist. And then um, in the mid 2000s, I studied coaching, life coaching specifically. Then the call, my own call to be a writer got louder than my desire to work with people. So I closed my practice and I became a writer for 10 years. I got an MFA in poetry and I published a book and an anthology that I co-edited. And then uh, in that time, I also got married. And then when I got divorced, I, it really, that was in 2012. And it became clear it was time for me to really figure out relationship because work had always flowed really clearly for me. I love my work. It turns me on. You know, I'm purpose driven. I love what I do. And somehow relationships were always harder for me. There was just a lot more um, thorniness, difficulty that everybody would complain that I would put my work first. And I didn't actually see that as a problem. I was like, yeah, of course I do. You know, it, it lights me up. If on, girl, why wouldn't you? Yeah, like it lights me up. What's the problem? But I had to really investigate what was really happening. And um, so uh, in 2014, I took a deep dive into studying relationship dynamics, sexuality. I got recertified as a coach specifically around relationships and um, and discovered, like rediscovered my passion for working with clients. So I've been working with clients again for the last five, six years. Um, oh my God, you look great for 80. <laughs> how, how old are you? Like how I'm many like versions of you are I you know. and you look gorgeous? I wouldn't well, even like you. think that you would have time for one career, let alone however many you just mentioned. Yeah, well, I'm definitely a multi-passionate person. Um, and oh, I like thank that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Multi-passionate. I'm writing that It's down. actually a Marie, yeah, it's a Marie Forleo phrase. Yeah. And it's taken some time to kind of claim that as being a good thing because I got the message from my father that if I didn't devote myself to one thing that I would never be successful or I would never, you know, just be a dilettante or whatever. And I found that whatever my passion is, I dive into it so fully that, um it's not an issue. I also have a passion for underwater photography, which this is one. I of was going to come and I love that photo. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I took that in Tonga. So, you know, it's, it's always for me a balance between my creative side and my professional, you know, working side and how to bring them all together in a way that feels great and have a great relationship at the same time. So. Wow. There you have it. Soul sister. Not only do you have awesome glasses, but um, my soul's digging your soul right now. Oh, back at you. Well, yes. I love your flip the script. It's, it's so fun to say as a poet. I it's know, really right? Crazy. I'm like, just flip the script. Come on. It's not that big of a, you know, like. <laughs> but well, anyway, yeah, I love it. I love the multi, multi passionate. So here's the I thing. am. And, you know, I think it's really important to honor those versions of ourselves. And it's, I think that that's been the biggest challenge for me. And I don't talk a lot about my challenges, but, you know, resonating with this multi-passionate side of who I am. I mean, we just bought a motel that we're turning into a retreat. Speaking of manatees, you'll have to come and do some photo photography. Oh, yes. Um, Are you near the Crystal River? Is that what it's oh, called? Oh, Wikiwachi. Yes. Like oh literally. I, that is on my bucket so list. Really, you'll have to come. Mm -hmm. It's gorgeous. We're right in the process of renovating this, these suites right now. Um, we're literally on the cul-de-sac of this canal, spring-fed, wow. manatees just in the backyard. So it's beautiful. Oh and that's my life has been a culmination of following inspired thought. I, I say inspired Love thought, that. but this and then going with it without having to have a reason or a goal because I'm passionate about it. And we talked about vision boards with Joanne. And I think that one of the reasons that I'm maybe visually challenged is because I'm more in inspirationally challenged. I mean, inspirationally inspired. Yeah, yeah. I get that. Um, I'm not super visual either, even though I'm a photographer. I know. I'm like, I just want to do it. Let me do it. You know, let me yeah. get my hands in and have the experience. So, mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. it's beautiful that you share that because there are a lot of people who think that they need to be one thing. And I think that that keeps us stuck. A lot yeah, of people I think I, I believe we're allowed to evolve, you know, mm -hmm. and especially in relationships. Margaret Mead um, said, we're living so much longer than we used to, 
right? I mean, when, back in the day, we lived about 35 years, right? Uh -huh. But we're living so much longer than we, than we used to that we will tend to be married three times in our lifetime. And if we're lucky, it's with the same person because Ourselves. relationship yeah. has to evolve. No, like there's yeah. relationships have to evolve with us. And there's right. the relationship you get into when you're young because you're romantic and in love. And then there are the relationship, you know, you get into, I didn't have children, but if you are having children, there's the relationship you get into that's the one to co-parent with, you know, mm -hmm. the, the one to have the kids with and the one to really strive for your success in life with. And then if you're lucky, that relationship can transition to the companionate relationship when you get older and your kids are out of the house and and you and you have this companion. And sometimes that works out and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's not the same person. Mm -hmm. um, but I really believe our relationships exist to evolve us, to help us in that evolution and to help us in that growth. Absolutely. Abraham Hicks, are you familiar with Abraham Hicks at all? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they speak of, I know it's a she who speaks, but they speak of making this commitment to death do us part. They would mm -hmm. recommend or suggest, strongly suggest that we make a commitment to, you know, I commit to you as we grow. And as yes. if we grow together and grow and evolve together or then grow apart and wish each other well and move yeah. into continuing to grow into the best versions of ourselves. And I always thought that was so beautiful. And mm -hmm. and you're reiterating it in the same way is that, you know, we evolve and grow. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. That's beautiful. Well, and I, I wanted to uh, dive into and, and unpack some of the work that you do. But um, I wanted to add to Elise, and there's also a comment that somebody has here. But at least I wanted to add when you mentioned about the multi-passionate. Uh, so honestly, I uh, I didn't know if somebody else had, had said this thing before, but yeah. I actually uh, had always said I was a multi-passionate, but multi-passionate person. But I always said, I wish I was a female for that phrase because my bigger phrase is multi-passionista. Multi ah, yes. so okay. You have a feminine side, Corey. I know. Exactly. I, maybe, yeah, maybe I can go with it. But anyway, I didn't like, it's like all these things, right? You go, I don't know if I created this. I mean, I never heard it from her, but um, you know, you always, I mean, we always hear from somewhere. There's always another source probably, but it's like Jack. Well, Marie Forleo, I, I heard multi-passionate from Marie Forleo, specifically speaking about entrepreneurs and kind of giving yourself permission to be into a bunch of things. Um, so yeah, that's I, where I heard it first. Well, I have somebody in my mastermind. I don't know. I don't think you met her at least, but her name's Kathy Dugay. And her and I for years have been talking about how we're both like that. We're we, in the mastermind. We're the two that are like, we're, she's a photographer, but when somebody says, what do you do? She can't say photographer because she does so many things and photography is just the kind of the core element. Um, but having said that, it's interesting because, you know, when I think about, for example, all this work that I've been doing with clients over the years and I have a friend uh, who you did meet, I know at least in San Diego, which is Tiffany. So Tiffany was oh, helping Tiffany. organize the event. And Tiffany worked with Jack Canfield. And I, I've done these things like uh, sur surrounding yourself with map, like figure out who I'm surrounding myself with and is that why I have a toxic toxic uh, energy and negative thoughts in that. And I did this one time because I was getting into a funk and it just came to me, well, why don't I see who I'm surrounding myself with? I did this whole exercise. I thought I created this. And she goes, oh my God, Corey, I love that you do that. The same thing Jack does. And I'm like, and well, does it really uh, matter? I mean, no, if it, it works and it brings you to this. Hundred percent. But the frustrating part is there's like ten things that I do that I thought I came up with that Jack does. Wow. <laughs> now Jack also you're, you're plugged into the same radio station. So. <laughs> it, now, <gasps> totally credits. tuned in, right? But not only that, he credits like, for example, the E plus R equals O. He says he learned it from W. Clement Stone, who said he learned it from somebody else. So what I'm saying is, it's not even saying that it's Jack's thing, but it's right. just like. You know, crap. You always think maybe we really are all one. Maybe, maybe this whole crazy theory that we're all connected is a really a thing. <laughs> Did you ever hear what Deepak Chopra says about that? He says that uh, I heard him at an event one time, and he said he talks about the quantum side about how little pieces of our body, everybody's is always shifting and stuff. Little pieces of oh, us. Yeah. And he said, so uh, I was here three years ago, and you would think that suitcase was here with me because it's the same one I was carrying, but that suitcase has never been here before. And then he, because he says all the parts of that suitcase have traveled. And then he talks about it. And furthermore, I think I'm a genius because Bob Dylan, a piece of Bob Dylan's been in me at some point. Huh. <laughs> because of all the like, all the little things that are always changing. He's saying that basically everybody's always, you know, at some point, a piece of you has been everywhere, essentially. Yeah. Anyway, 
whether you believe that or not, I don't know your point. At least we're all, you know, we're all part of, I think, one. I was being sort of facetious, but it's true. I mean, like, you know, the question comes, somebody shows up, you know, that kind of thing. I have a question for you, though, Murray. So mm -hmm. when you work with, as a relationship alchemist, you know, I'm, 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 my mind goes to couples, right? Yeah. You work mm -hmm. with couples. I, I actually that, mostly work with individuals. Sometimes okay, because when I work with, with clients, I work with a couple, but individually, like I never work with them together. So I was curious. Yeah, yeah, because there, there really is, it really is all about them. And they're getting a mirror of whatever's up in their cup, whatever's coming up mm -hmm. was already in there. So thank your partner and be pissed off if you want, but thank them first and figure out what is it that they stirred up that was already there. Yeah. So, so you work with individuals, which is really interesting. In, in relationship to relationships? Yeah, because, well, what I've seen a lot, and maybe you've seen this too, is that when one person starts to shift how they're showing up, the relationship changes. So mm -hmm. I don't actually have to work with both people. If both, if both partners are really committed to the work, great, I'd love to work with both of them. But very often one partner tends to be more desiring of change than mm -hmm. the other. Yes. And that tends to be the one who reaches out. And um, and I, I'm just thinking about an email I received yesterday from someone who I'm, I'm currently three months into a six month small group mm -hmm. called Relationship Alchemy. Um, and I received this unsolicited email yesterday where she said, um, like, I my partner was the one that really wanted me to do this. And I was skeptical because I've done a bunch of coaching before. I didn't think it would work. And why do I have to be the one who changes all the time? And, you know, yeah. I was really irritated. I came in with a lot of resistance, but uh, three months in, you know, what I learned, what I've learned so far is that, oh, this is what happens when a heart has begun to close and a heart has begun to have layers of armor on top of it. Mm -hmm. And through, shedding the resentments and shedding the old stuff and and committing to open my heart the whole deni dynamic has shifted between us and 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 the most surprising thing to her was that she has started softening and getting more vulnerable in places where she used to butt heads mm -hmm. and through doing that her partner has naturally begun to open again and even said i've missed you and that's so oh, powerful. I, yes, you know. It's so powerful. And well, I didn't even work with the partner, you know. But it, you don't have to because once softening. somebody changes the relation, everything, everybody around them in the relationship, Everyone everything changes. changes. They're like, but da-da-da-da-da, so-and-so has to do it. No, I'm like, so let's set your intention and be really clear and just sit back and watch. Because yeah. some crazy, excuse my language, shit's going to show up and you're going to be exactly. like, what? I didn't what? even talk to you them. Know, you don't I even mean, have to have I do yeah. There's that, there's that piece, the energetic softening and opening piece, but there's also skills. I mean, I, I teach communication skills. I teach how to make clean and clear requests. I teach how to, you know, uh, reduce the resentment you're carrying. I teach how to show up in a centered way. You know, I teach people to meditate and have some kind of practice where they're tuning into their own body and their own system. Because I really think a lot of the ways we misbehave in relationships are happening because we're traumatized, we're jacked up, we're stressed out, we're in a pandemic, we're out of our minds. And so the more we turn our attention to actually staying as centered and clear as possible with permission for all the jacked up parts of us to exist, because it's not about suppressing or rejecting anything, um, then we're able to show up in a wholly different way, which changes the response. I love it. I love it. Yep. Well, and it's, it's not, it's not about the couple. It's about the individual being you're a well-being and you show up as a well-being, right? Yes. I love that. And, and not well-being, one word, well-being, hyphenated. <laughs> yeah. Well-being. I love that. Showing up as a well-being well, yeah. <laughs> instead of a, a nuts being as, as um, uh, so happens to me a lot anyway. Or an but, angry uh, being or a frustrated or an, being right. or a judging being or resentful. Yeah. But we often Which, don't take the root, root of what the words are, like well-being. I, like I, I, for years, I never thought of the word e extraordinary as actually extraordinary. I never thought yes. that. Yes. 
there's a lot of words I do that where later I'll go, wow, wait a minute. That word makes you know, like sense that way. It makes so much sense. By the way, thank Help you. Um, comment on Facebook. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you enjoy the photograph. Yeah, I was going to say that with well-being, I always think of it as one word. So like I never think yeah. of separating it. So anyway, there's a lot of words like that. Yeah, this was actually Annie, by the way, who said, I'm dying to see the photo behind you. I'm a passionate photographer and especially anything in the sea. So I just wanted to- And, put that and that's a little, that's a tiny, tiny, it's so far back, it's probably hard to see, but it's a tiny, tiny fish that's um, about the size of a, of a fingernail popping out it, popping its face out of a hole. You almost have to have a microscope to see them. So that's like a super macro shot and that's a very wide angle shot. So I love going in both directions. Shelly's a photographer. Was that a drone, that. Was that a drone that you used? To no, no, I'm underwater. Oh, see, it's hard to see the perspective from here. Yeah, no, this is in the water with the whale. So one, one thing I wanted to ask you, I said I wanted to unpack a bit of your work and Elise has already helped me do some of that. So, but what I want to ask you about going the other perspective, you mentioned, okay, well, sometimes you only have to work with the one and then they make the change and the other person says, wow, I've missed you. What about the other side? Cause I'm sure that must happen too, where uh, or you work with the person and they in their head, whether early on or it takes a while or whatever happens, ultimately they go, wow, I've outgrown them. Yes, that That's happens too. Right? I'm sure that, that also happens. I have um, a client I've been working with for a while who was, uh, it, a lot of my clients, I don't know about y'all, but a lot of my clients tend to be in therapy at the same time or have been in therapy for 10 years. And then they're like, okay, I have to actually take some action. And then they yeah, have I mean, all this talk you know, about being fixed is not yeah, working it's like, like, no like I'm ready to like be coached so, into the best version of myself. Right, right. And so um, so she, she's been in therapy for a long time. And, and for about 10 years, her marriage has been not really working. And she knew she really needed to leave. I mean, he was literally ignoring her. Like she would speak and he would literally not answer. Um, and, and it was breaking her heart. And um, so it, here's 10 years of therapy. And then after seven months with me, she left because she finally got enough worthiness and enough of a backbone to say this is untenable and I can't, you know, I, I, I will no longer accept that this is all I get. You know, not that she's about getting because she's a giver, but, you know, it's about that give and take. And if you are getting zero positive regard and zero attention and being actively ignored in your own home and being actively dismissed. You know, she was so gaslit. She thought it was her fault. She thought it was because he's also kind of a master at having her believe it's her fault, um, as some people are. And it took, you know, it took us only seven months to get her to the place where she could have the strength to move out. Now they're not out, you know, they're not out of the woods. It's a difficult process. It's not like magically her life is amazing. But I can say now, after a few years together, that she, I mean, she's just doing beautiful work in the world. She, that constant critic in her head, I work a lot with our voices that we have in our heads. Um, that critic, uh, she's able to put it aside and stay kind to herself and get done what she needs to do. And she's found a sense of purpose. And I mean, it's just beautiful to watch her unfolding. Um, and she's even able to be around him now and go, even though there is a little part of her that's like, oh, that's my person. I miss him, you know, as as often is the case. Um, she's also able to see him from back here and go, oh, wow, there's that thing he does that used to loop me in, that used to rope me in. I'm not going to take the bait. you know. So she's able to keep her perspective where she can be kind, she can include him in things with the kids, and she cannot take the bait. And that, to me, is freedom. Yes, well, and that's what, isn't that what we're all looking for is a sense yeah. of freedom. Whatever yeah. we think we need to do to get it. Exactly. I try, so I'm, I'm more... Uh, you know, a lot of solutions. We look for solutions. I'm like dissolution, dissolution based. Like, let's Tell dissolve me it. We don't even mm. need solutions. We want to dissolve mm. whatever it is that's keeping you on this side of the ultimate mm. freedom that you're waiting to give yourself permission for. Absolutely. You know, and one, one other thing, when you said that it made me think of this, you know, one of the first questions I'll ask is, I, well, I pose to someone is ask yourself, 
and recognize that you, you only get what you tolerate. So oh, I only get what I yes. tolerate. And so that brings up, that, that creates a platform for, well, why is it that I'm tolerating that? You know, it opens mm. discussion up. Absolutely. I only get what I tolerate. I mean, that's, that's one, of the, one, one of the global truths is that we only get what we tolerate. Like we all have that in common, no matter what language we speak or who we love or, you know, whether we love ourselves or not, you know, we only yep. get what we tolerate. And it's just such a great opening. So, for what you were just talking about, like why is she? Absolutely. Why? Why would she tolerate that? Be and there's so many levels that well, there's that so many levels that you address. And, yeah, yeah. So, there's so many levels to why we tolerate. So it's not really about him. It's really about the individual. And and when you say you work with that in individuals, it's about why is that? Why are we as individuals tolerating what we're tolerating, and getting to the root of that? Yeah, well, yeah. I well, go ahead, Corey. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that. Um, that I tend to, I tend to excise the word why from the vocabulary because I tend to think, I tend to find why puts us down a rabbit hole, like because I hate myself, because I suck, because I'm lame, because life is terrible, because it's systemic this. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it tends to disempower. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I touch on the why enough with someone just to kind of have a basis of understanding right, like the a, background. Oh, I never thought like, about it like that. Like, but, but I really focus on how do we install the small habits? Because I, I believe self-love is not built in the abstract. You don't just magically love yourself because you bought a bath bomb, you know? It's like, you, you <laughs> like, right? It's I mean, it's, it's just not. <laughs> and that. that's, a, that's, that's a good book title. There's a good book title in there. But anyway, yes, I love that. Thank you. I appreciate it. But like, you know, it's, I, I think, you know, self-esteem is built by esteemable acts. And I think self-love is built by lovable where acts, where we demonstrate love for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that may look like saying no, that may look like I need to rest right now. That may look like, wow, I've been working really, really hard and I need to take a step back. That may look like I need to work harder because I've been slacking, whatever that looks like, um, being attuned to enough to what's happening in here mm -hmm. is, and then actually doing what you, your innards tell you to do, you know, like, oh, you need to cut off communication with that person because they're toxic in your space. It's like, okay, then, and you do it. And then it's, and then part two is you actually celebrate the thing that you've done that was caring toward yourself I'm a because huge so often we're celebrating. Yeah. We're just so focused on growing that we forget to acknowledge the tiny things. So I have all my clients do daily wins. I have them, you know, uh, share wins with me when we get on the call, because most of the people I work with tend to be very driven, very high powered, um, successful, uh, and hard on themselves, super hard on themselves, perfectionistic. Right. And so, in order to begin to soften that dynamic with oneself, we have to acknowledge the small things, even as we recognize there's a longer road that we want to go down that we haven't gotten to yet. And that's okay. Or even when we mess up, to acknowledge like, oh, shit, you know, can I curse? Anyway, like, I whoop, you know, <laughs> okay, you know, it's like, whoo, I messed up, you know, but I say it dirtier with an F, um, you know, it's like, whoop, I messed up. And, and then you move on because as a recovering perfectionist, uh, you know, it, it, the permission to make mistakes and the permission to be imperfect, it, it, it is everything. And that's also where we can start to build more self-regard and self-love and show up in our relationships more authentically and more powerfully mm -hmm. because we're not jockeying for approval by trying to be perfect. And, you know, uh, one of the things that you said to circle back, but there's a reason why I want, I'm going here. It's a, I'm launching from it, but it, I at least said about um, you get what you tolerate. And one of the mm -hmm. things that my girlfriend says all the time is you teach people how to treat you. Amen. And, and I love that as well because. Yeah, it's like the first cousin to what I just said. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, I mean, so I, I kind of, I always think of that whenever, you know, what am I tolerating to that point? But. I'd love to circle back to the relationship side of things and get your thought on this because you are working with one at a time often. But one of the things that Shelly and I used to do, and we got to get back to doing it because I'm writing about it in a book right now. I'm working on a new book where I'm writing this, so I need to act on it. 
uh, what we did, uh, and this came from her. She's a former addict. She's open about it. I guess you're never yeah. a former addict. She's an addict um, yeah. recovering. But um, six years sober. And one of the things she took away from her treatment was a thing called MEPS. I don't know if you remember this, at least. I don't know if you were share this for uh, wow. MEP. But what it stands for is, and I got to think it through. It's been a bit since we've done it. Uh, mentally, emotionally, physically, socially, and spiritually. And mm -hmm. so that's what that stands for. And what we did, and we stopped doing it. And we got to get back to it. So this is my reminder. Uh, but every week on Sunday evening, we would sit down and say, how am I feeling mentally? How am I feeling oh, emotionally? Okay. How am I feeling physically? Uh, how am I feeling spiritually, meaning am I grounded, what have you? How am I feeling socially? Did I spend enough time with other people this week? Am I be mm -hmm. isolating myself without realizing it? And then what we do is here's what I'm grateful for. And she always adds in, uh, and what is, I forget what she calls it, my whole, uh, Hail, Hail Mary or Holy Grail. What, Hail Mary. Like what, in other words, what is my one animal I want to see this week? That's her thing, like mm. an eagle or whatever. And then the eagle is to her represents whatever she wants to see represents, okay, you're on the right track. Oh, I love that. That's so, like a cool. God wink. I call them God winks. Yeah. So the, so her God wink at, at the end of that, she adds that part in and the gratitude, we added that in, but the MEPS thing was what she learned from treatment. And the whole okay. idea was, is because they go into it when you're in treatment before that, when you're an addict, you go kind of hide, right? You isolate. Yeah. And so yeah. you, them, you need to share your feelings. My point of this, my question out of all this related to relationships is what are your thoughts on the idea when you're working with one with how they can better communicate with each other? Because what we found, Shelly and I, is by making time for that MEPS, that was us making sure we communicate with each other in that week. It's not the only time we do it, but it makes mm -hmm. sure that we're constantly talking and stuff because we know we're going to yeah. come back and say how we check in. That's what she calls it, a check in. We're yeah, checking. check in. So anyway, what are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I love that. Couple? John Gottman, I don't know if you know the Gottman Institute, but they do a lot of amazing study around relationship and they call that that um, check in. They call it a state of the union. So th they recommend sitting down on Sunday nights and like having a state of the union conversation. Um, so I love that you're plugged into that. And the MEPS, uh, you know, organizing principle is great because you want to figure out how you're doing on all those levels. And what I'm hearing and what you said that I really liked is that each of you is doing that for yourself and then sharing it. Is that right? Yeah. And that's, so that's how you really stay connected. So what she actually, what we do, I'm just trying to remember. So if somebody wants to do it on their own, I'm trying to give them the, the I, I thought I'd ask you the question while also sharing it so people might be able to do it. But uh, my and, uh, uh, Tiffany, who I talked about earlier, is a coach and she started doing with her clients. And she said, Corey, it's one of the most powerful things I did with them. Thank you for mm. sharing this. But uh, one of the things we say is Corey checking in. And so that's me coming in. And at the end, uh, we say all my relations, which is yeah. basically like saying Corey checking out or whatever, uh, bringing in all my relations. But and it comes from um, obviously uh, an indigenous indigenous. Yeah, practice. that's an indigenous. Because phrase, and yeah. she was, uh, went in sweat lodges and stuff, and that's where they kind of learned this. But yeah. and so they brought it into their treatment center. But I say all this because basically I'll check in. I'll say, you know, mentally this week I'm feeling like this. Emotionally I'm feeling like this. This week I didn't spend as much time with people as I should, so I'm really low spiritually. And we share all those things uh, and openly just share them, like no thought or judgment or what have you. And at the end, then we have a discussion about what we just shared. So like mm -hmm. in other words, she'll say like, you know, well, you mentioned that you're going through this. I wonder if this might be a solution. So then we take mm -hmm. it into a, a bigger conversation. But yes, to your point, first it's for us to just share openly without judgment. And then we come together on it as a union. So I wait. love that. That's gorgeous. Me too. I'm implementing it tonight. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. well, we got to get back to it. We did it honestly, <laughs> religiously for probably about three or four years. And then we fell off and then we've been back and forth. But I'm going to make sure it goes back in my calendar as a firm thing. Uh, it's but, such a beautiful way to stay connected. Yeah. So what's the question? <laughs> well, yeah, the question is, um, do you recommend... And I guess maybe I know the answer based on how you responded to that. But do you recommend when you're working with one person, like, do you say to them, you know, you need to have a communication time. You need to have a way to communicate. And obviously it doesn't have to be like this time every week, but is there, how do you make sure they're communicating is I guess what I'm driving at. Like what's the way to yeah, make Yeah. I mean, it depends on, it depends on the state of the relationship, obviously, like what they need. Right. Um, but often I teach um, how to initiate a, a vulnerable conversation or make a request because that's um, what I find. There's often a breakdown where one partner, you know, is either asking for things and then they're not happening and then they're resentful of that, 
or they're not asking for things because they have a story that they should be independent, they should be able to do it all themselves, and then they don't ask for help, and then they're resentful that their partner didn't notice that they're struggling, and blah, 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 blah. So I, I tend to focus a lot in the arena of setting up conversations so that they tend to go well. And the first piece of doing that is checking in with yourself and feeling how you feel. And if you don't feel like you deserve to make this request or ask for help, that's where you start even before you open your mouth. You got to really get into your rightness of, oh, yeah, you know, I deserve to have my partner make me a cup of tea, you know, because I want it, not because my leg is broken, but because I want it, you know, and things like that. So first we work around that piece of really where am I coming from when I when I make the request or when I want to initiate the conversation. Then you want to ask if it's a good time. Like if you're, I mean, Patrick and I, my partner's name is Patrick. Um, Patrick's really great about communicating when I come to him at not a good time, you know, if he's driving or if he's cooking or if he's doing something else, that's not usually a good time for me in, to initiate a request or a conversation of, about something because A, his focus is divided, which never goes well because he's a very singular focus kind of being. And B, um, he'll tend to forget. Like if I ask for something when he's focused on something else, he'll forget the request. So he'll say, hey, would you text it to me? Or he'll say, hey, would you ask me later? Or, And, and so we've worked out this kind of shorthand um, through trial and error. And, you know, me making a lot of stories about like, well, I asked you for blah, 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 and you didn't do it. And that means, and he's like, no, it just meant you might have asked at a time when I just wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I was like, oh, so, you know, ask if it's a good time. And if your partner says yes, that tunes their listening, right? If, if someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got something vulnerable to share with you, or hey, I've got a request, is this a good time? You know, you're going to be like, oh, okay, I need to focus my attention here because something's coming that I need to remember. And so it, it, it's beneficial for both partners then you ask for the thing or you say the thing. Now, if what you're bringing is more of a vulnerable share, like, hey, I've noticed we've gotten into this habit where we're both on our phones at dinner and I'd really like to change that. I'd like to, us to be present with each other at dinner and put our phones down. Um, you know, you might want to say why, this is something I learned from our relationship coach when we were working with her, if it is a more vulnerable communication, you want to proceed it with why it's important to you and what you hope to get out of it, like where you hope to get to. Like, So I'm sharing this thing, like, hey, I've noticed that we've been on our phones a lot at dinner and we're not really attending to each other and I'd like to shift that habit. And the reason I'm sharing it is because I want to feel more connected with you. Or the reason, because otherwise they might go into criticism, right? They might go into like, I'm being criticized and they might get defensive and be like, I'm not on my phone. What are you talking about? And it's like, no, the purpose of my sharing this thing I'm about to say is so that we can come into a deeper connection with one another again and, um, and, and have a good time together. And so then again, that primes them to be listening for things that you're asking for or that you want in such a way that they can stay open to it instead of going into blame or going into self-criticism or going into defensiveness. Does that make sense? It does. And I love what you just said there. Uh, one thing, it's funny because I use that in sales, which is, I mean, it's a weird jump from here. But Ooh. Ask this, it's all ask relationships this. though, isn't it? It's all relationships. <laughs> well, and, but it's kind of interesting because I never thought about the I mean, the psychological about the benefit of doing it in that respect. I thought about it from the perspective of I wanted to justify asking so they didn't think it was intrusive. So what I'm getting at is if I was working with a client and I like I used to sell photocopiers years ago, the door to door. And these are high price machines, but you don't know with a client's mind what is a normal price. So how do you broach that subject? Like you don't want to price something that 20 grand, then their head they think it's five thousand dollars. But at the same time, you don't want to undersell them. And then think they can spend three thousand dollars when the machine should be ten, and they have twelve thousand in their budget. So how do you ask what their budget is without them thinking you're just asking that so you can charge me five dollars under it? So what I used to say was, um, the one question I have is, do you mind me asking? Do you guys have a budget set aside or an amount of money uh, that you plan to spend on a machine? And the reason I ask that is, so I don't mm -hmm. let them make an answer first. The reason yeah. I ask is because, and then I'll explain the whole situation. Like I just want to range. I don't want to know exactly what you want to spend, but I just want to make sure I'm not thinking that you're looking for a machine that would be in a print shop, which is a higher end machine uh, versus a smaller machine. 
And, you know, we can talk about your need and, and work on the budget there, but I just want to make sure I'm not way up to lunch or I'm not scaring you with this price. But by me saying all that before they ever say the price, I find it gets their energy down. Like they're not mad now to say, why, how dare you ask how much I'm looking to spend? So the reason I asked that is I used to teach yes. that for salespeople, but I never thought about the other side of what you said is that it's already calming them down rather yeah. than going, whoa, you're asking my money, how much money I can spend on a photocopier? Do you think we can't afford it? Like there's a whole right. bunch of uh, money. Anyway, yeah. I don't know why I did it. I just No, but that it's beautiful. It's it's yeah, I mean it it it's diffusing. It, you know, it's a it's a diffusing uh phrase that again promotes openness. Because the idea is you want to be open to each other and and the idea is you want to get better at each being able to sit in discomfort and hear things you know, truths that are different than your own, which is why I think okay. relationship is one of the greatest growth paths we have because- She on your side, at least? Uh, no. No? I can see you. He asked, oh, okay. he asked if you froze, but we're good. I can hear you. We're good? Okay. 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 Um, so what I was saying was, you know, by, by diffusing things and kind of really cultivating this atmosphere of openness where each person gets to express themselves honestly, but you know that it's with the intention of getting to a place of connectedness or getting to a place of reconnection if you've disconnected from one another. Um, that pre-framing is, is really helpful. It's a helpful thing to do. And that, that just uh, sparked another idea for me, which I wanna share, which is um, in any, so in relationships, we tend to get very sort of focused like this on each other and like my way, the highway, you know, I want to win and I want to, right? Who's got more power? Who's getting all their way? Blah, blah, blah. And and uh, a very encouraging shift or a shift I would encourage folks to make is to actually turn and look together at what I call the union. So it's more like a triangle where there's you there's your partner, and then there's the relationship itself, which some people call the third. There are poems written about it. Robert Bly wrote a beautiful poem about the third, um, which I don't have memorized, so I'm not gonna quote it. Uh, but um, it's also called the union. And and so by, by put, turning your attention to what's gonna serve the union here, so let's say one of you wants to go on vacation and the other one is afraid to get on an airplane because of COVID-19, right? So it's like, what, okay, well, what's going to serve the union here? Is a vacation going to serve the union greater than the fear of getting sick? Or is staying safe and home uh, going to serve the union better? So that way you both get in a collaborative space and you're more likely to stay on the same team with respect to what's gonna serve the relationship and your family if you have kids better. Uh, and so I find that also a helpful shift in terms of how people view challenges or differences in relationship is if you get your attention off of each other and off of whatever childhood wounding is being activated in that moment and instead stay on Keep the time. Words the same team. Yeah. Stay on the same team and look at, well, what's going to serve the relationship? What's going to serve the union? Sometimes it will be one partner's uh, point of view that will serve the union better. And sometimes it will be the other, but it's not like compromise where both people's desires get chipped away at and nobody gets what they want. <laughs> does that make sense? It does. And uh, you know, I'll add in, it's funny because when you talk with diffusing, one of the things that I found, it's weird how sometimes you can do something and then the energy from doing that thing just once a week, let's say, carries forward. But Absolutely. I was, and I, and I want to circle back to something uh, Jack Canfield does and something John Gray does, just as we wind down to post your thoughts on both these things. But it's funny because one of the things we do as well to diffuse the, you know, maybe a tough week or a tough day is we do uh, either Friday night or Sunday night dance parties. And it's become interesting because now we have the baby involved. Like, so he can't obviously, he can't even get out of his little bed. So my other son like moves him and shakes him like he's dancing too. And he's smiling. And so, but Shelly started filming it. So we might start, you know, just showing it to people because it's amazing what it does for our energy, like how that carries yes. more than just a half hour of dancing. And it's funny how this is the most amazing part, why I brought it up, how often the three-year-old son says, dance party, I want to do a dance party. Now, like in his mind, it's like an exciting family thing. So I thought about when you said about harmonizing and including the kids, 
because it's amazing what that's doing. And I also, yeah. I, I, it, I'll never know, but I think it's gotta be having a good effect on the three month old who's seeing us do all this. And we film well, it with an iPad and he's like in the back, like just like, yes. <laughs> like but he's like, being, <laughs> it's a I love that because that's the thing. The more the kids can see the parents being joyful together and enjoying each other and doing yeah. something pleasurable, it's good for the kids. Like they want to feel your connection be fun and juicy and together and hot, you know, like that, all of that is, is good for them. I and mean, it's you know, learned. Absolutely. Like we have yeah. to learn how to love one another. And so what better way to learn than to see a relationship when your parents are interacting and enjoying it and, and give, and so then we can give ourselves permission. I see so many times that, well, you know, we've been grown up in very serious environments and we exactly. have a playful side and the playful side is, is squashed because it's yep. not how you're supposed to be in a relationship. And it's bringing that playful side back out again. And so you're showing your kids that, I mean, hello. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yes. So it's so needed. It's so needed. Uh, somebody Tell you, Corey, you're changing the world by being the parents that you're being because you're growing well beings. <laughs> but you know, I mean, you know? It's, it's not easy, and we and those are the pretty moments, if you will. Those are the polished moments. But I have to say, I saw somebody post the other day, and this really struck me. He said his mother always told him, "Oh, I know who it was. Even it was um, Kelly Card Card Cardenas, who uh, runs a bunch of salons. Oh, yeah. Do you know who Kelly is? Uh, he is a I've heard the name. He has like uh, dreadlocks. Uh, he has a book. I forget what it's called. But anyway, Kelly Cardenas. Uh, he said my mother always told me." The most important thing I can ever do for my kids is show their mother that I love her. Yes. Amen and, to whoever he amen. is. Amen. Yeah, and, and trust <laughs> me, he does. Like he's constantly uh, highlighting his wife, like how much he loves her and stuff. And it's not fake. Like they're they're just in love. Yeah. Like I've known them now for five years and they're just like, you can feel their energy. They're just always in love with each other. But I mean, think That's of the lesson that their kids are getting. But having said that, by the way, last night, Papa who's the, obviously the grandfather, uh, he was over to pick up his phone that he forgot from earlier in the day. And my son goes, dance party. And then we bought a new speaker. So they have the speaker on and it's, he's 70 some years old dancing with them. I mean, like, so he's getting that. Anyway, it's just, it's neat to see uh, that. It even gave him, by the way, his grandfather, who two the two grandkids and my girlfriend said he won't hold Sebastian or the other baby until they're like two. Anyway, he was in the hospital for both kids. Like, and it's funny how it's different as a grandfather than as a, you know, a father to her. He never held, yeah. either, he never held his other two grandkids who are both in their twenties now. He never held his kids, but he's like dancing, doing a dance party. It's amazing to yeah. see. But That's anyway, I, mm. I wanted to mention Jack Canfield. Uh, speaking of somebody who's seventy, Jack's I think. Yeah. 70. Um, oh, congrats to Jack. What's that? Sorry. Congrats to Jack. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, he seems like he's still a 20 year old. Uh, he's got that energy, but one he's of them got a very childlike spirit. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, both these guys are going to mention because John Gray, I think is 70 some as well now. And John mm -hmm. seems like he's 20. Uh, Bob Proctor seems like he's 18. Um, so anyway, but because we mentioned him earlier, but Jack, one of the things he teaches people and talks about is one of the things him and his wife do is every week they do a check-in and Jack will say out of 10, where do I rate this week? And if there's anything less than a number, let's say it's anything less than an eight, he says, this week, what do I have to do to get it to a 10? Yeah. And they talk about actually how he can change for the rest of the week to stay at a 10 or get to a 10. My, yeah. And that's one thing. Second thing I want to, I'm going to share both of these since we're winding down and ask your thoughts on both of these. Uh, John Gray, one of the things I love that he talked about is uh, he says men and women are different, obviously. And he said with females, the, if you buy a female something, it's the uh, there's a, a dopamine that they get from that one item. And he said, so when men think I'm going to buy a dozen roses or a car and say, I bought you one thing a year ago, you should be fine. What he says is if you bought a dozen roses, one each day, you would actually get more return than buying 12 roses at once. Because every time you give one of those roses, it's a new wow excitement. So just like the car isn't as big as maybe buying five items separately that you thought of on your own over a month. Anyway, I'd love to get your thoughts on both of those ideas because those are two popped in my head around relationships. Thank you. I love that. Um, well, that first practice is beautiful. I've heard Brene Brown talk about something similar with her husband where they kind of like rate how they're doing and, and ask that gorgeous question, like, what do I need to do to bring it to a 10? Um, I think it's just good to be on the pulse of 
the relationship with each other, whether it's week to week, whether it's once a month, you know, I don't have a prescription on how often, but just the other night, uh, Patrick and I were watching a movie or something and, and he turned to me and he says, how's your happiness right now? You know, how's your, how, how are you doing? How are we doing? And we ended up turning off the thing and just having a conversation because it arose spontaneously, right? And it was just this desire to kind of, and I said, well, actually, you know, I, my feelings were hurt yesterday because we went out to dinner and you got on your phone on, at dinner. I mean, he was looking up a song. It wasn't like he texted anybody, but it was just like, I really wanted his full attention. And so, I, and I just, in the moment, normally I name things in real time because I'm practiced at that. But in the moment, I didn't name it in real time. So that actually gave me space to to make a request. Like, hey, I have a request. If we go out to a restaurant, like I, I just request you put your phone away and look up songs later. And he was like, great, I can totally do that. And it came out without blame. It wasn't sticky. So anyway, just any time you feel moved to open that door and ask that question. And I think it depends on the couple, if it works better to have it on the schedule or whether it works better to have it arise organically. I think that's something each couple needs to work out. Um, uh, with the John Gray, um, I agree. I think it depends a bit on your love languages. So mm, absolutely. Um, you know, if you're someone like I'm definitely uh, very responsive to acts of service and gifts are less meaningful to me. So, you know, uh, to me, I get more dopamine off of him going to the store and picking up my favorite, you know, oat milk latte or whatever. Um then I do roses, although I love, you know, I love to get roses. And, and so I think to me, the deeper thing is getting to know each other rather than coming from a prescriptive place, which I find John gets into a, a bit. He's a bit prescriptive of like men are always like this and women are always like this. And I tend to work with a lot of queer folks and I tend to work with some non-binary folks. And so my gender thing is way not not binary or prescriptive that men are this way or women. I mean, in my relationship, I I often hold more of the masculine. My partner, I'm more of an alpha. He's more, you know, of a beta. So it's like, I think you really have to go couple by couple on that and get less um, sort of wedded to gender, historical gender roles, because I just don't think that's the world we live in anymore. Mm -hmm. um, bless his heart. And so, uh, with that kind of thing, I, I I look more to what motivates each person in the couple. Is the person motivated more by affirmative phrases? You know, do they want to hear they're doing a great job? If that happens to couple with them being in a male body, okay, then that makes sense. But, uh, you know, and if someone is more motivated by or feels more loved because you did something for them or because you touched them, or because you you say the nice thing, or you spend quality time together without distractions. You know, I think the more important thing is to figure out which thing has you feel most loved, and and do that for each other. Take the free quiz. There's a free quiz online around. Yeah, five love languages or something like that quiz. Yeah, just take both. Take the quiz and and for your kids to too. It's great it. for families and their kids and know oh, what yeah. language kids love language your child has because exactly because you're gonna tend to do the thing that you like, but you may do that till the cows come home and your partner doesn't feel loved because it's not the way they most feel loved, and so it's a way to win with each other that kind of goes beyond strict gender, binary, outmoded things. So, I mean, it, it sounds like it could be, and it seems like a common- Yeah, because I don't like roses, Corey. <laughs> like it would be well, sunflowers for me, you know? <laughs> well, and it sounds like a common theme, not just this week, at least, but in general, mm -hmm. uh, that I hear these days in interviews, is we seem to be more now in the personalization era than ever before, meaning mm -hmm. customer service, we want to personalize to us, not what you, like, so I, I always say now there, I don't, and this is not meant to be sacrilege, but to say like the golden rule, I believe it exists, but I actually think the platinum rule is more what people are looking for now, which by the way, I think I made that up, who knows? We talked about that earlier, but the platinum rule to me is don't do unto others as you would have done to you because maybe they don't want it the way you would have it done unto you. Do unto mm -hmm. others as they would have done unto themselves. Unto them, yes. Right? Personalized to them, not you. So the goal is like, treat other people as you want to be treated. Well, what if what if they don't want to be treated like you want to be treated? Exactly. So exactly. 
So on that end, I, I love this, but it feels like in every aspect of life now, it comes back to, it seems like people want to be treated like individuals, personalized now, instead of the system of what should be the case. So yeah. let me ask you this though, just in, in following up on that, uh, I think like now I'm going by memory, but I thought it was the five uh, languages of love that said this. It may have been a different book, but I know it wasn't Men Are From Mars. It said, and I'm getting sure it's the five languages of love, but it said, um, men want to be treated with respect and women want, want to be loved. But should that maybe now be tweaked to say, certain people want to be treated with respect and certain people want to be treated with love and you need to figure out who you're with. <laughs> is that? Well, that's, that's the piece. Perfect. Like figure out who you're with, you know, because we all have masculine and feminine inside of us and some of us, and a lot of us switch like, uh, you know, so like I'm a primarily feminine person, but I'm in my masculine a lot as an entrepreneur. Right. So um, and a thinker and a creator. And you know, so I'm in that very focused there. There's a what's coming to mind is there uh, is a couple London Winters and Justin Patrick Pierce who teach um, sacred sexuality and, and sort of relationship dynamics. And they talk about alpha and omega. They, they just have gotten rid of masculine feminine. And they talk about being in your alpha energy or your omega energy instead. And that way it, it allows for the fluctuations within a relationship where one, sometimes one person might be the one who sees where you're going and have the direction and be the more purposeful. And the other might be holding more of the emotional kind of um, feeling space. And, and so when you kind of get off of masculine and feminine and start to think about alpha and omega and what, again, what's going to serve the union, because if you're both in your alpha, that's not super sexy. And if you're both in omega, like it's hella watery and nobody gets anything done. And so one partner kind of needs to be willing to polarize to the opposite to actually have action happen. So um, I like to think of it more in that way. And, and because of that, then the question becomes like, what's going to serve the union more right now for me to polarize into Omega and kind of invite more feeling, invite more of a loving space, or for me to polarize into Alpha more and invite a more respectful, you know, disciplined, action-oriented, purposeful, directional space. Does that, is that answer your question? Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. You mean summed it up perfectly. Um, because, well, it also made me think of when you said about it's not necessarily a strict rule anymore, or never has been really, but we just maybe thought it was a strict rule. This person's like this because they're this gender. But I think about our relationship, Shelly and I, I mean, I'm not the one that hangs the stuff on the walls. I'm not, yet. we bought her, I bought her a power drill. Actually, my mother bought her a power drill, pink power drill uh, at home because she loves doing that stuff. And she, but she's into crafts and she does all kinds of stuff with her hands. I'm not that guy. And yeah. I, I tried to work as a, a carpenter for my grandfather, and he literally said, you know what, I think you may be meant to be following down your mother's path and going into business. <laughs> I don't ah. think it's for you, but my father was a carpenter and my grandfather was a carpenter. So, but if you looked at the pattern, you'd say, well, Corey's supposed to be a carpenter because it's masculine. But I didn't go that direction. And so, and when we're at home, I don't hang the stuff on the walls. I do, again, I've gotten better. I'll say it that way. I do some of it, but I primarily am not the guy that does that kind of stuff. So what does that mean, right? Like, if you go by the rules, the rules is I'm supposed to do that and she's not? Where did that, where did that rule book well, come from? Well, the question right. is, whose yeah. rules? And right. who are they who that made the rules? I mean, that's cray cray. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm I mean, in a relationship with, we're, we're both fire, Leo and Sag, and we're both that, you know. And yeah. we create together and we're a great team. However, we step on each other's what I call energetic toes a lot. And so yeah. we talk about learning how to dance in a space. Mm. And I love to dance and he's not such a big you know, into the physical dancing. But when we come into a room or come into a conversation, that's more than just him and I, we have to be able to, who's going to, like you said, Mar Marie, is like pull back and allow, like, who's going to lead in this space? Because otherwise mm -hmm. I know I shut down because yeah. it's just too much. I don't want to compete. Yeah. But, right. And then, and then shutting down in that space I'm not digging the version that that version of me and I like we're getting to know each other, but she's not like my most fun. And so right. there is that being aware 
of what we bring to the table and we call it dancing, learning how to dance and be able to do it in a way where we're, we're still connected and it's not, you know, butting heads or, you know, blowing yes. us apart. Beautiful. Love yeah. it. And so, I know we uh, we went a few over time. I hope that's okay with you, Marie. I hope we didn't keep you from. Okay, so just I uh, just wanted to share a couple of comments. Uh, somebody just uh, well, I guess they just said hi, Corey and Elise. Um, <laughs> Whoever you are, hello. Hi, Patrick McCorkle. Hopefully, Patrick, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And then um, the other comment here, I was trying to find out who said it, but they just said choose to be in a purposeful space and relationships. Interesting. Uh, so. That's kind of a shout out to you when you mentioned that. Um, Thank you. So this has been an absolute pleasure. Like I said, I even hate shutting it down because I know. great energy, great conversation. And we haven't really covered relationships to this level at all uh, since oh. we flipped your script. So this is like yeah, sweet new. stuff. Very sweet. Very cool. so where can we find you? How could How somebody can who's ready to have a relationship with themselves and a relationship with everyone else find you? Well, my website is memolly.com. So it's my first initials, M-E and my last name, M-A-L-I.com. And on Facebook, you can find me at slash M-E Molly Coach. And I also have a Facebook group that's for women. And thank you. That's for women and non-binary folks that are comfortable in spaces that center the experiences of women. And that is Relationship Alchemy with Marie Elizabeth Molly. And right now I'm on a little bit of a hiatus in terms of going live or teaching a lot in the group because my mother died recently and I'm giving my mother my, myself space to grieve. Um, but I will be going live, starting to go live again in the group um, within the next month or two. So come join, I comment, I post, but I'm just not teaching a whole lot right now. Um, and so those are the main places. I'm on Instagram as memolly108, which is a sacred number that I love. That's also my Twitter and my LinkedIn. So I'm on the I'm on all the spaces. I have a YouTube channel as well, which is basically my name, but no hyphen. So it's all, my name all smooched together, uh, Marie Elizabeth Molly. Um, and um, yeah, I would love to connect with anyone who wants to have a deeper conversation around relationships. I work one on one with folks of any gender. And I work in small groups, uh, again, with a more woman centric uh, focus. And the next relationship alchemy group will start in February. So awesome. Corey, are you going to add her contact to the comments or Maria Elizabeth, you can go I, in and do it. In and do that, yeah, right? just put it all up in there. And then this way, okay. anyone who goes back and watches the replay will see your information and, you know, they don't have to go to out like the third, you know, three hours and 40 minutes or whatever to find it. Um, so they can go right to the, the comments and find that information there. Great. I'll do that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It's been so great talking with both of you. I mean, we, Corey, we've just been, we've been in this long conversation to have me come participate in things. And I'm so glad we made this happen. Thank you for taking the time and the space as you're honoring the space for your mom's transition um, and then coming and joining us during this time. You know, we appreciate having you here and, and, thank and you. choosing to spend your valuable energy with us today. Thank you. It, it felt good. I've been super choosy. That's it. That's the accurate, accurate. Ooh, we got this. chosen, Corey. Yeah, you got chosen. Cause yeah. I mean, it's funny cause it's, I don't know what it is, but um, I feel very hypersensitive energetically to different spaces. And so, you know, I'll, I'll get on a networking call and I'm like, nope, not right. And I leave in five minutes or I'm just like, nope, not going to do that. Oh, yes, I'd like to be there. That feels good. And so I just feel oh, very you know, energetically aware I'm at the moment. I'm thinking that so a beautiful compliment because I just yeah. think that your energy is beautiful and, and, and getting to spend time with you has just been lovely. I mean, I get to see your picture in your little bio when I put these like social media bites together and I'm like, I want to know who she is. Like, I could already tell. <laughs> She's a soul sister. <laughs> totally, totally. She, I think you saw her glasses and you became obsessed with the glasses. I just <laughs> like your look and your vibe. It's not just a Thank physical you. look. It's the essence of, mm. of who you are that comes out in that smile. So, you oh, know, thanks. I get to see the little back end thing and I'm like, I wonder if I'm right. You know, and then when I get to meet everybody, I'm like, mm, I would nail that one. Yep. Oh, right on nice. Point. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, beautiful. thank you. I, I really appreciate That's a big compliment for me that, 
that who I present and who I actually show up as are aligned. So thank you for, yes, you know. Yes, your union between you yeah. and you is working. <laughs> Yay, that feels really good to hear. Thank you. And the glasses are Thierry Lazry. So oh it's T-H-I-E-R-R-Y. Oh my L A S R Y. I forget which model it is, but if you go on the Terry, it's a French company. And um, Did yeah, you I say found them. T E R R or T H? T H. T H I E Terry, like T H I E R R Y. Last year, L A S R Y. Because that's the yeah. one thing I. Yeah. yeah. These are actually, uh, these were sunglasses, but I had them made into regular glasses. So I was like, that. These they are, look these so are good my, on you too. These are like, my glasses. They totally fit your look. Like it's a whole. Thank you. Look I used thing. to wear these tiny cat eyes, and it was like I look back and I'm like, wow, that woman felt small. <laughs> no, I'm like, and these two, these are Dollar Tree. I'll shout out to Dollar Tree, and I'm always like, where are they? Like, and I haven't really put much thought into it, but the more I'm going live, like I have another mm. event too. I'm keynoting in in like an hour, and I'm mm. just like, I want like to get online and feel fun, and it's this fun is to have not the direct. Yeah, it's not really representing of how I feel really. It's kind of like just so I can see. <laughs> yeah. Which it's is like great. It's wall, but yeah, that's it's great. Really and you and, know, exactly. and it's fun to have a more statement. Yeah, I need to kind of it up a little. So yeah, so right on. Well, we will let well, thank you, you. Like, I know we've taken a lot of your time. So I thank you. I salute you. I adore you. And as I that's always so say, right. I'll call it a to be continued. Uh, Mary Elizabeth, but there's lots more coming from you within the Blue Tox ecosystem in the future. Uh, so thanks for being you. And like I said, we'll we'll hold space for you, but thank you for spending your precious time with us today. Oh, yeah, thank absolutely. you so much. And I'll I mean, keep thank you, you for this series. It's just so beautiful that you're offering this and that you're doing this and helping so many people, getting to impact so many people in a good yeah. way. Thank you so much. If you're inspired, we might have you come on for a half hour on a Flip Your Skip Friday. And so you and I can chat. I'd love bit. that. Yes, Would please. You? Okay, absolutely. I'll reach out for sure. Right, exactly. And then we'll talk about manatees and how you can come and do some photos. Because that'll oh, be so I've much been fun. dying to photograph manatees. That's a total bucket list item for me. All right. Well, we got Hospital Hole where all the manatees come to kind oh. of like heal right at the oh. end of our canal. So it's an oh open space and an open invitation. Thank you. I, I'm I'm there as soon as it feels good to travel again. Get in an RV like we do. Bring your home with oh, you. Oh yeah. That's that's actually a good idea. I'm not I'm not outside the realm of considering that. <laughs> We've been traveling my fiance and I for about two years on the road, working remotely. We happen to be in a space right now in a home, but We've been working remotely and traveling and bringing our home with us and driveway surfing and really just creating our lives um, through gorgeous. all of this. Hmm. And I like getting creative and being problem solving. And so, you know, this is one way to still live. And yeah, so you have any RV yeah. questions. You just oh, great. I will look you up. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So It'll great. Be fun. Live in a 23 foot RV with your boyfriend yeah, or that's, fiance that's for it, a year and right? a half and then come back and let's have a chat. <laughs> yeah, let's talk. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> fiery cool. signs in a 23 foot rv yeah oh my god yeah, yeah. So oh, anyway. I, that that must be fun <laughs> hey that could be actually that could be a three-month program all right here you go here's your here you go foot RV. here's your rv there you go both of you go here's two bicycles yeah. plan your trip and then let's come back and chat in three months relationship That's actually a really cool idea relationship oh, yeah, that could be like a show Totally. It would be an amazing reality show. Like relationship that's immersion. That's what it could What's be. That? Like two people that don't know that. each other. Huh? I said, she, uh, you need to look into doing that as a show. Think what that would do for your brand and how many more people you could impact. Well, we have an oh, RV. Yeah. We actually just bought a new one, totally renovated it. And then this motel came available. So we were buying that. But we have another RV that we're actually creating a space to go out into the war out into the neighborhoods and bring neighbors together through food, music, and personal experiences. So we've dedicated her, her name is Maggie. Uh, she's a majestic. And so we're dedicating wow. her to bringing and connecting people and relationships together because I personally believe that's how we're going to grow into the world that we want to live in. One well well being at a time through personal yeah. experiences. So we can chat wow. about it. I That's mean, she's cool. open. Maybe we do something like that just for yeah, fun. I love that idea. But yeah. And I, I agree with you. I think it's connection, you know, growth really happens in connection and transformation yes. really happens in connection. 
So I call it so the more vote we for can the pop-up that party. <laughs> That's the party. I love the that, pop-up pop party. party. Well, you guys definitely have to connect. Yeah, we will. Forward. For sure. Oh, yeah, thank I love you, so you much. Um, for bringing such amazing people to light. Mm, Absolutely my thank pleasure. Thank you. And and really, thanks again for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm excited to keep doing stuff with you. So That would I be great. Can. Say hi to Patrick for us. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. We'll uh, send you the back, but uh, not for long. We'll, uh, we'll call it to be continued, as I mentioned. Beautiful. Thanks, thanks. for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Well, uh, at least I won't keep you very long. I know you got to run because you're doing a keynote soon. Yes. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention really quick, which I it just popped into my head, it's worth people checking it out. There's a book that I, because I didn't we didn't talk about book recommendations today, so I'll just throw this out there. Okay. Um, when you were talking about glasses and you know how maybe these glasses are just for seeing, but maybe you actually need one that could become like your superpower. And uh, Marie was talking about how she needed to think bigger, and the glasses helped her do that. It made me think of a book I just heard of. Uh, I'm trying to think of the exact name, but the book basically is about your alter ego. And what this guy talked about is how he actually has studied and been proven that when you put on the persona, mm -hmm. you actually rise to the occasion. So in other words, if uh, you put on your favorite uh, soccer player's shirt and you get in that mind space, obviously you're not going to become the best soccer player in the world necessarily, but you're going to become better than without wearing the shirt and being in the mindset. And he said, mm -hmm. like, for him, he puts on glasses and a little seeker for a couple of years is he would put on glasses because he believed he looked more intelligent in glasses. But he said the frames, like there were, there was no glasses. They were just like regular, whatever. I've seen called. that before. I've seen, and that would be even better because it wouldn't be a glare. hundred <laughs> percent. But I couldn't, I mean, I can see you, but you're all blurry. So, I mean, I do need to like, yeah. Well, while I think what's of it. the book called? Yeah. I just looked it up. While I think of it, it's called the alter ego effect by and the books by todd herman and on the book he actually has a pair of glasses <laughs> because again that was his superpower put on the glasses become i think it's kind of neat because i think a superman right clark clent mm -hmm. put on the glasses to disguise who you are and then take them off and that's the super superpower Here's right. a guy wearing glasses uh with no uh frame actual like what do you call that with the with glasses like your lens yeah but yeah the lens like whatever the you know how it's like a reading or something like your certain the frame? Yeah. No, but like the lens, like the, what do they call it? Like the different prescriptions? Bifocals? No, but the different prescription levels. Isn't there different names? Like, I don't know. Far-sighted like, and near-sighted? I guess so. Uh, what, I, what I'm getting at, I guess, is his lenses weren't prescription lenses. That's what I'm trying to say. So they his were just was, plain lenses. They were just glass, essentially. Yeah. Anyway, I just thought I'd, uh, I just thought I'd share that book, Alter Ego. So again, it's called The Alter Ego, The Alter, where is it? What did I say? The Alter Ego Effect by Todd Herman. Anyway, it's a really cool book. Where I learned about it is uh, the, one of the networks we're going to be on with Blue Talks in the future is um, Connect TV. And they feature Jay Shetty's conversations. Mm -hmm. And Jay Shetty interviewed this guy about the book. And I had a plan in the background. And then I was like, ooh, really intrigued. And anytime I'm playing something in the background and it pulls my attention away from what I'm doing, I know I need to listen. And Absolutely. So, uh, I, want to I wanted to mention something when... Um, Marie Elizabeth, I guess it's both names, right? Marie Elizabeth or just Marie? Marie Elizabeth. I think it's probably Marie Elizabeth. Then. Yeah, she was talking about being multi-passionate. And the, I mean, I don't know why it just came to me, but so I, I would talked earlier about the children's book that I wrote called IRDM, exclamation point. That's important because it's part of the title. And I wrote this book a few years ago. I'm not even going to tell you how old I was, but I was having what I called a self-concept meltdown. Subconcept is the way that we see ourselves, how we recognize our value, um, how we show up in the world internally for our own self, right? And I have had multiple backgrounds. I have a culinary degree. I used to work for Martha, do recipe testing and develop for Martha Stewart, Gourmet, Bon Appetit. I used to work right from Working Mother. I had a graphic design degree. I owned a creative play space for children. Like I've had, I was a private charter chef in the Caribbean, you know, for years. So there was so many passions that I have that I explored and became great at and loved and had those careers at the time. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, when am I going to become something? Like, when am I going to be validated for that one thing? And I thought, you know, but if I was told growing up that I already was everything that I thought I needed to grow up to become, 
-hmm. right now. And I was just going to become a grander version of all of these things that I was inspired to be. Would I be having a self-concept meltdown right now? Would I be having an issue with being so inspired by so many choices like a buffet, you know, in the world. So I wrote this children's book called I Already Am. And really what that represents is a little girl who's really good at so many things. And throughout this book, she recognizes that she already is all these things that she thought she needed to grow up to become. And then I thought, well, now I nailed it. All I have to do is say that I'm a children's book author and that I could take everything that I've been, you know, and been inspired to actually move forward on, not just wait, but create. Um, but I never tell anyone I'm a children's book author, which is kind of funny because I thought that that was my solution. But that's really what this book represents is about being multi-passionate. And I think that that's something that, you know, we have an opportunity to talk more about that. It, you don't have to just be good or, or do one thing. Um, you can have multiple things that you do and be, be successful at, at all of them in your own right because you're honoring your passion and your inspiration so i just thought that was a good wrap around and a tie-in to what we were just talking about being multi-passionate so agree and uh it's also fitting because you mentioned that you were going to gift uh three of those books yeah so now it's perfect it totally makes sense and then annie uh evans mentioned which you know we glossed over it but annie mentioned that anybody reaches out she's she, i think she said she'd gift them a copy of her book um, yes. I heard her say it twice and maybe three times, and she said it to me in the past before. So there's a potential to get a book no matter what. And then just this is a full circle back to what I said for those that might not have caught us earlier mm -hmm. saying it. Um, and I think I have a call coming in. I'm going to decline here on my computer. Uh, but, uh, you know, the other thing that we mentioned is that um, one of our clients or one of my clients, Frankie Picasso, said she'd gift a copy of her book. I don't have the name in front of me, but I think it was Midlife Mojo, I believe. But mm -hmm. it basically I like about. It discovering uh what you were called to do and um and basically living voice and offered uh five copies do i have them in front of me so yeah five copies of my book i'm gonna do uh draws for five copies of my book the book of why and i said three copies of the blue then the first blue talks book the second one's about to hit the street soon but the first blue talks book i guess i missed uh, the so, deadline for that yeah <laughs> we, oh, we'll well. work with you and <laughs> Um, but it'll still come. But uh, but having said that, so that's basically ultimately it works out to I think we're at twelve books right now. You have a potential to win, and all you have to do is comment. So just put a exactly. comment below, which you would probably do anyway. But uh, meaning like it's just a comment, like what are you taking from this? What did you enjoy? What I find interesting is some people go, wait, I want a book, and it's because I thought, you know what? Why not just put it out to the universe that if a person comments, even if they didn't know they were supposed to, that mm -hmm. means they were meant to be put in the draw. Exactly. And also just so to mention that, so the book that I have is print on demand and it's through Amazon or Barnes and Noble. So whoever wins that book, I'll just order it directly and have it sent. So we don't have to worry about Canadian postage or US to Canada. We can just have it sent directly. So we'll, we'll reach out to the winners, get their contact information, and I'll have the book directly sent to them. Awesome sauce and bluetox.com for people that want to know more about bluetox. That's everything bluetox is there. Uh, I should mention, I didn't mention it earlier today, I guess, but it's bluetox without the E. I think people probably know that if they're watching it. Right even up in here my, in the corner. It's in Where the corner it? over there. Uh, it's in the corner, but it's also under mining too, that you're putting exactly to it. Uh, yeah. But bluetox.com, that's everything there. You can find it podcast book series, uh, the YouTube uh, channel, which we sometimes are starting to air some of these as well. So if you miss the replay, you'll get a piece of some of these as well. So lots of places to learn from us about Blue Talks. And then the other thing is, just to finish this off, at least you have an event coming up. I know they're probably late to register, but it still can't hurt to support the event or go check it out or all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I'm not sure if they, event? it's, I'm, I'm speaking at four o'clock Eastern at the Solopreneur Conference 2020. So it's the first Solopreneur Conference. And this conference is supporting coaches, um, spiritual guides, independent business owners, what we would call, um, uh, what would you call it? Not a solopreneur, but um, uh, independent contractors, people who are working on their own. You don't have a team, right? You are, you are your business. A lot of times we go to small business events and, you know, they support the small business and how to manage your team, no matter how big or small. And there are things that, you know, as a solopreneur, you don't really need. So this conference is dedicated to the solopreneur and I'll be speaking on how to flip your script, how to begin to recognize 
and start to create your story without being stuck in an old story, right? Mm -hmm. Because they talk a lot about story. They're going to be surprised when I come in as the final speaker because I listen to some of them. And, and, And it's great about having a story and how stories sell and how they're relatable. I have a little bit of a twist on that, and I believe we can get stuck in our story because a lot of times our story feels worse than the thing itself. So how to be able to intentionally create the story, right, of who and how you want to be and show up in your life right now. Be the creator, right, instead of waiting and being held by held back from the past story. Really start to linguistically reframe whatever it is that's holding us from that ultimate sense of freedom, no matter what you're doing, you know, like people ultimately, that's what we want, right? Is that ultimate freedom. If somebody wants to learn more and have a conversation with me about really the first steps to flipping your script or even, you know, start some coaching and take an intake, just have a conversation. They can go to elisrothman.com. I do have a free download. It's called Flip Your Script. And I use the word mind seeds, grow in a rich, abundant life you love. And so that's a free download. Feel free to start there. And it's at my, it's Elise Rothman, I-L-Y-S-E, Rothman.com. Feel free to pop that up because- it's at least with an eye, but um, so you can, you know, feel free to reach out. My phone number is 757-339-9604. Really texting me is the best way to reach out to me um, or even messengering me. Emails get lost. I get so many of them. Uh, so texting or, you know, DMing me is really the way to go. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, I have it correct there, right? Yes. You did. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, so go over to uh, the Solopreneur Conference, um, the website I put there, and even just send a tweet to them or something to show them some love. Even yeah, if you can right find now. out when the next yeah. event's coming up. That's what I was going to say. Or reach out to uh, Laura and find out when the next event's going to come up. Uh, you just saw Elise's website. Go visit Elise. Um, you've got to hear the last couple of days how you can work with Elise and how she can help you. Uh, so definitely reach out. And your family. Yeah. I love families because they're little units, just like you're growing this amazing family, Corey. I follow you on Facebook and these little dance parties and the things that you are wondering if they're making an impact. I promise you, this is a message through me to you, that you are actually growing, seeding, cultivating, nurturing this shift that we're all speaking of that we want you're actually you're doing it making more impact there if you can believe this than all of the impact on any blue talks platform that you've created growing and nurturing these little beings to grow into these magnificent beings is where the change starts so you guys are you and shelly are like spot on and i'm glad that you're on our team Oh, thank you so much. I'll make sure to tell her that because she doesn't get all the credit. She doesn't get as much credit as she deserves sometimes. So I'll tell her, make sure she knows that. Definitely. Um, and we'll let you run because you now have 59 yes. minutes before your next event. I know. So- and I need a little break, but I'm going to go. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow. Well, actually, I'll see you tomorrow, right? 11 yeah. o'clock, 12 o'clock. Do you know what, what time does it start? Uh, let me just check because we did have a, a different time. We started earlier today than normal. So let me just make sure I tell people the exact time. I will put posts out earlier tomorrow. Than this one, but tomorrow we start at 12 Eastern. Okay, perfect. I will see everybody then. Absolutely. Awesome stuff, Elise. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thanks, Corey. Appreciate Uh, you back. Sending great blessings for your talk and positive vibes, and you're going to crush it anyway. So go have fun. Thank you. Yes, thanks. (laughs) See everybody.